No, it's just okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, welcome to, I think, is this our first Sonic Speaker Series for the spring? We had a, we had a yeah. bunch for the year, which is for the winter, the spring, whatever you want to call it, for the year. I think that's the only thing we had in the fall. We did. Did we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I'm just really thrilled that even though we are at the end, tail end of the winter quarter, we have such a turnout, so uh, I'm sure that speaks volumes to uh, how interested you are in what our speaker, George Vega Young, is going to talk Recording has started. Today. And uh, so, as you probably noticed, he walked in with his bag, so we're thrilled that uh, for once the airlines cooperated with us, and he was only 20 minutes, 16 minutes late arrival time, so... George comes to us this morning, this afternoon from Los Angeles, where he is uh, bias. He's a both a research. He started out as a research professional and then transitioned into being a PhD student in the biostats department at the uh, um, at USC. He's getting a PhD there in the School of Preventive Medicine. There is a very good group of people at USC who do uh, network stuff in the in the medical school. Um, Tom Valenti uh, and Kayla, who works closely with George, and who will be here in the fall, as the speaker already has accepted. So, uh, Kayla, uh, so today, uh, George is going to talk to us about uh, a very specific challenge that we confronted a few uh, a year ago, and so, and that is uh, dealing specifically with the issue of how do you apply, uh, how do you use exponential random graph methods models to analyze really small networks. And you might think, why would you want to worry about that? Isn't that, isn't that like an automatic? Well, as some of you in the room know, uh, and one person who's not in the room, uh, but who was in Sonic at the time, Zach Gibson knows very well, that when you get really, uh, I think Brent is saying everything is okay. Oh, okay. it's good? That uh, when you get really small networks, like when we study NASA crew members and crews of four members, then you get really small networks, then trying to use uh, MCMC Markov chain Monte Carlo methods to analyze really small networks can actually lead to all kinds of estimation problems and convergence problems. And so we were very thrilled that when uh, it was brought to my attention by some of the students and everything, Diego may have been one of the first to bring it to my attention, that there are actually now an alternative way where you don't need to use MCNC methods. And so part of what George has been the trailblazer in pioneering, which is intuitively such an exciting idea, is that when you have such small networks, why do you need to go do simulations when you can actually talk about the census of all possible configurations and work with that? And George not only had that idea, but took that idea and made it into a code base. And so we actually have our code to do that kind of analysis. And so George's presentation here is a two-parter. Part one is he's going to give a talk about the general ideas, and then it's going to be followed by a workshop right after this where he's going to show us how to use our code to actually make it work, etc. So I'm really excited. As I said, Sonic Speaker Series tries to focus on catching them young and seeing the young stars. And I, you may well be the first graduate student who is a person who's been invited as part of the Sonic right. Speaker Series. I don't think we've ever had a graduate student. We've had postdocs. And we've had faculty, junior faculty, but I don't think we've had graduate students before in this. So we, had it once. we did. Who was that? Uh, the Ryan Boyd. Yeah, Ryan Boyd. Oh, right. Who worked with Penny Baker, yeah. Jim Penny Baker on Duke. Thank you. Yes, you're the second. Okay. Right. <laughs> that, that's still <laughs> that's still pretty darn good. Yes, <laughs> we've had quite a few of them, etc. So uh, join me in welcoming George, and thank you for meeting us here in the middle of this cold weather from Southern California. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you guys. So uh, we don't have that much time, I think. There's a lot of material that I would like to cover with you. So let's get going. So as you can see, uh, today's talk is going to be about small networks. A lot of people may think that that's not very fun, actually. Not very like um, uh, complicated, but actually these are very complex. Uh, and the of talk it's uh, big problems for small networks. Statistical analysis of small networks and team performance. So this is paired up with actually network outcomes as well. And this is joint work that we have been developed with uh, developing with Professor Hay. Yeah, I think this should be working, and it's not. So you see, we have the. There you go. Okay. 
So first of all, uh, this work is being funded by the um, Department of Defense. Also, we come with the collaboration of the USC's High Performance Computing Center. Again, so these are small networks, but these need a lot of computation, so that's why we are using that. And this is part of the, a bigger uh, umbrella of research that is part of the NURI research team, uh, the Network Science of Teams, um, in which we are working with USC, uh, UC Santa Barbara, um, USC, MIT, and Northwestern. Okay. So first, the research problem. Uh, I would like to add, actually, earlier versions of this talk, I kind of like jump right away into the methods and into programming because that's what I do most of the time, but people get confused, so I'm going to give you first a, a, a bigger scope, so why, 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 where do this, uh, how did we start actually to think about this problem? So first, the first question is, how can, uh, so in, in the context of network science of small teams, so small networks, what characterizes the social network that emerge from social for small, from small teams, right? So what the structure, so it's pretty much the, the question that you will ask with an exponential on the graph model, right? But besides that, we're interested about is if, the, if there's any association between the network structure and group uh, performance, which I'm aware that uh, we're not the first group of people asking that ourselves, right? So, and, and these, two, these two questions are the, 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 the cores that we're going to be going through this, this time, okay? So first, um, to answer these two questions, we have some data uh, presented here on an experiment in which essentially the, the experiment consisted on inviting people to our labs, okay? Uh, in which uh, every time that we invited people, we invited between three to five, four to five people in which they, uh, we grouped them up in a mixed gender uh, teams. And the idea is that we asked them to solve tasks through a, um, a, uh, during a, an hour using a particular set of tasks that try to measure collective intelligence. And this, this group of tasks actually was developed by MIT, uh, which is part of our, our new research team as well. And the key, the key thing here is that besides of asking these team members uh, some uh, social demographic data, we actually uh, measure some other interesting statistics, like for example, social intelligence. Uh, so by the way, uh, I put now here, I'm, I'm the methods guy in this project, so I don't know anything about psychology. Professor De Haye will be, be will be happy to answer any of those questions. I can't address them to them, but to her. But uh, so just I'm I'm just showing what, what's our project about. But I, I don't know anything about that in particular. Okay, so if you want to ask me about the math, I can tell you that. But this part I don't I don't I can't. Okay, so first we're asking them. So uh, we we measure some uh, social intelligence. Uh, scores, in particular we, we measure social perception, which is measured by the R and &E measurement, which means the reading mind in the eye, which I like to think of as the ability of people to be able to like to read out someone else's mind, to, to think, to know what they are thinking a little bit, to be like, uh, there's also social accommodation, social gregariousness, and social awareness. And the network point of view, we actually uh, measure a bunch of little uh, uh, networks. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you must be aware of the survey methods that are used network nomination, right? So how, so by the way, I need to ask this, I, I forgot to ask this. So how many of you uh, use ergoms or know about ergoms? Okay, this is great. <laughs> this will make things way easier. So we're in yeah. ergom country. This what? is an ergom <laughs> country. <laughs> country, okay, okay. Nice to know that. So I think that we asked them uh, network nominations. Uh, we, 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 took, we did some network nomination questions in which, in which we, we asked them who, they, who do they seek advice from, uh, who do they think are their leaders, who they, do they think they influence them, uh, and some other questions. But these three are the most important ones that we're going to show some results for those. Okay, so that's the data, that's the background, and this is the, the structure of the, of the talk. So first we're going to start with network structure, right? Exponential random graph models, I don't need to tell you much about those. Uh, since you, this is network every country, uh, it should be fine. But here is a network that I, I, I'm sure you, are, you have seen before. This is the Friendship Network from a UK uh, faculty university. Um, uh, the data is from iGraph, and the network visualization is by George Truly. This is an art package that I've been developing that's called NetPlot. If you're interested, you can take a look at it. But the thing is that, as you know, with exponential random graph models, what we're trying to answer is, how can we explain what we see here? So because this is obviously, this is not a, a random graph, right? This is not random. We see some structure and a lot of structure. Okay. 
As you know, arguments are the lingua franca of social network analysis. We try to answer this question about what social, what local social structures gave origin to the observed graph, right? The model is centered around the vector of sufficient statistics, as you should know, and is operationalized in this way, which we have an exponential function, right? Uh, a set of more parameters, theta, it's a vector as well, and the, uh, the vector of sufficient statistics. With this, the uh, infamous normalizing constant, right? Which, as you should know, the, the problem with, with this kind of models is that the normalizing constant here is very complicated to compute because you, essentially you need to calculate the, uh, the statistics for the entire support of your, of your network. Which means that if you have, for example, I don't know, five nodes, you know, you know how many calculations networks you have if you have five nodes? How many possible graphs can you get from five nodes? About one million. So if you well, objective graph. So if we have six nodes, it's about one billion. Seven becomes four trillion. So as you can see, that's why most of the methods are relied on MCMC. Uh, and also an important part of it, which I, I'm sure you know as well, is that what motivates the sufficient statistics are, in particular, are social and psychological psychological mechanisms that have, are hypothesized to give origin to this structure. Right? Here are some. There are some examples of structures that you should, uh, you, I'm sure you'll use on, on a daily basis, right? We, we can measure, uh, for example, reciprocity using the number of mutual ties that how you calculate that. We can also measure balance, which in our group actually in the Muri team is very important. We, a lot of the research that has been done actually looks at balance, which is essentially can be translated as the friend of my friend is my friend, right? Uh, we also can take a look at homophily. Whether two individuals, whether an individual who sends a type to other, it's uh, they share some, for example, feature. It could be the same gender or age. Also, we have this very interesting effect, which actually we'll look at a bit later on, uh, which is called a covariate effect for incoming ties. At least, at least that's the name that they put up in Ergon, the Ergo package, um, which we just translate, for example, for popularity for a given uh, type. So, for example, it could be how how um, how many ties do women receive in a group, in the network? So you can operationalize that with this statistic, and you can have more exotic shapes, like for example a four cycle, which I don't know, I don't have any uh, example from the top of my head to like tell you how can you translate that to a social phenomenon. I don't know if any of you have worked with that before. That comes in handy when you're doing bimodal networks. Okay. But then you have two different types of nodes. And you're looking oh, at the cycle. That's, okay. that's a very common place where okay. it Excuse me, I'm getting out of a very bad cold. So it's California, but it's been raining, so not very nice. But getting better, getting out of it. <coughs> okay, so here's an example model. So, how many of you, since this is urban country, so how many of you have actually calculated? For example, uh, write down the, the likelihood function of an ergo. Raise your hand. One, two, three. Okay, so this is a good example for you guys then. So, for example, if in this small network that we observe here, in the case of this particular statistics, we see that this network has four ties, right? Four edges, one transitive triad, and no mutual ties, right? By the way, if I'm going too fast or too slow, just let me know. If anyone has a, any question, just let me know. This is not a straightforward thing. A lot of times we use all these methods, but we never actually take a look at what's, I mean, into what's going on under the hood. So please let me know if you have any questions. Okay, so in this case, of, 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 in this small network, using this statistic, the likelihood function will look like something like this. Okay, so we have, again, the, the exponential term here, the number of, of edges, uh, one tri just the triad, the balance tie, right? And no, no mutual ties, so it gives you like a zero, right? And here is some, the, 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 the normalizing constant. With a set of parameters, we did, this is the set of parameters that we would like to estimate, okay? In this case, if we estimate a maximum likelihood estimator of this small network, which is actually feasible, we will obtain this set of parameters. So, Emily estimates for edges is minus 0.19, which, is mean, which means low density, lower than expected by chance. 0.17 for uh, the transitive triad, which means more 
frequent than expected by chance, and point, uh, minus 0.97 for new plot size, which again is, is lower than expected by chance. So uh, an interesting question that uh, my advisor made, actually, he's a mathematician, so he said, why didn't the mutual term go to minus infinity in the, in the, in the model? Because you don't have any neutral size. Well, the answer is, well, because that's not the only thing that you have in your model. So you have other terms, and those affect what you obtain in your estimates. OK? Everything, everyone is following me? OK, are we good? Okay, so in the case of... Hey, George, when you go back then, uh -huh. if you didn't have any of the other terms, would the mutual go to infinity? Probably. Probably, yeah. Yes, yes. We can try. We can see. But I, I, I guess that, it, that should be the case. That's what you were thinking. That's the implication yeah. of what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, so in the case of... Uh, again, so the problem with estimated ergons is the problem with uh, is the issue with the normalizing constant, which, which has a lot of terms, right? For this reason, uh, methods that have been developed for estimating ergons have focused on actually avoiding, completely avoiding the disnormalizing constant, which is hard to calculate. Thus, relying on MCMC most of the time, right? Okay. And by the way, so uh, uh, how many of you have looked at What's the process that is used to actually estimate an ergon? So how many of you, of you have looked at the, like the steps or the iterations? How many of you know a little bit of that? Okay. Yeah, so I, I recommend you to actually take a look at it, and uh, even if you don't fully understand it, because once you get a, 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 the big picture about how is the process to estimate an ergon using simulations, you can actually use that knowledge to make it, the, the estimation process faster. So at USC, we have the CANA group, the Center for Applied Network Analysis, and I've been giving some uh, uh, workshops about the ergons. Um, I focus a lot of time, I put a lot of effort to try to uh, show how the MCMC process works. Because if you know that, how you may be able to make a better interpretation when, you, when your model fails, which is not actually, um, which is something that happens a lot. Right? So if you know a little bit of this, this actually can help you. Here's a, a general description of the algorithm, the MCMC ML algorithm developed by Ayer and Thompson. There's another one actually that, for example, I, I'm, I'm guessing that you use R for, the, for all this, right? Mm -hmm. How many of you uh, have ever used PNET? All of us, at okay. some point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, in PNET they use a different algorithm. Okay. So in the case of uh, the MCMC ML algorithm, the, the, what they do is that they first do an initial guess of the model, of the parameters of the model, in particular, what they use it's called a, a maximum pseudo likelihood, which essentially means just running a, a logistic progression. They just run a, a logistic progression, which is bad because it's not taking into account the dependent, the Markovian dependencies, but they use that as a starting point. And then uh, here comes the simulation part. So while the model doesn't converge, what they do is that in order to be able to calculate, to update this parameter, what they do is they, they simulate a, 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 a large uh, stream of, of graphs fixing the, the model parameter, okay? So in other words, what they say is that they say, okay, let's assume that this theta hat that we have is actually the true theta. So using that to simulate a bunch of networks, and I mean with a model made like thousands of them, uh, they use this to approximate the normalizing constant and so the likelihood function. With that, then the problem becomes very similar to what you would do using a logistic regression. So the only thing that you need to do is just update the theta parameter right after that. So in other words, we have a, a theta, we, with that we simulate a bunch of networks, once we have that, we approximate the likelihood function, and with that we can update the, the parameter theta. And so updating that, we can start over again until we reach convergence, okay? Once you converge, the last values of the theta hat is actually your MCMC ML estimates. That's what's going on under the hood in, in very broad, broad terms. The variance approximation is a different story, so we are not going to talk about that here. But that's that's the thing, the idea. Okay, uh, everybody okay? Everybody good so far? <coughs> okay, so the issue is that while significant adv advances have been made in the estimation of these models and CMC, they actually have a, a ton like a, a, a optimizations and new ways to like a compute the, to simulate the graphs. We have a big problem that is called uh, model degeneracy. So, how many of you are aware of that? So, not know uh, something about the model degeneracy. Okay. So, the idea uh, of the problem with model degeneracy actually has to do when uh, when the model parameters 
live kind of in an area which is uh, degenerate, which means that when you are doing your MCMC sampling, you will get networks that are uninteresting. For example, you may get a very often the fully connected graph or the completely empty graph, okay, which is bad, right? And because of that, this yields poor mixing. So that's the whole thing. So I guess so. This is in the MCMC part. What we observe here is that this is uh, just a, a figure from the uh, from Harvard in 2003. This is showing us the trace of the MCMC algorithm that generates the networks. So as you can see, the number of the of edges in the in the in the parameter jumps all over the place like that. So when you have an MCMC chain, when you have, when you want to see you want to see like a I don't know like a an earthquake meter or something like that, that, that kind of states around a, sing a single area. This is not what you're looking at here. And this is very bad. So this is what we want to avoid. And the thing is that the model of degeneracy is particularly problematic with small networks. And that's uh, uh, actually that's shown in pre hurry So I wanted to show you that. Um, and why is so why is that more problematic with small networks? Well as I just said, the problem with model degeneracy is that we a lot of times get like super uninteresting graphs. For example, fully connected graphs. So, what, what's the chance of getting a fully connected graph when you have four nodes? Sorry, two nodes. It's like 25 percent, right? Because there are only four possible graphs: the fully connected, the fully empty. When uh, A sends a, a tie to B, when B sends a tie to A. So you have only four possible graphs. And 25% of those graphs are fully connected, and 25% of them are fully empty. And that's why here's a bigger problem. Okay? Okay. So this takes us to a small network, right? So here's just a visualization because this is a talk about networks. Here's a, net, a group of networks. Actually, these are the networks that we have in our study. So these are networks of size four, and as you can see, we actually observe a lot of structure. These are not completely random. And what we want to do is that we would like to actually use the Argon model to estimate this. Okay. So the, as I was telling you, in the case of small networks, when, you, when we have at most six nodes, the calculation of the kappa term, the normalizing constant, becomes computationally feasible. When I was telling you about a million terms, one billion terms, actually that sounds a lot, but for a mobile computer actually it's not that much, not that many. So when we do direct calculation, we actually avoid the need of, uh, of, of doing simulations, because the whole problem is with this. We do simulations because we want to approximate this normalizing concept. If we do direct calculation, we, we don't need to do that. And um, with that, we can actually get any <coughs> maximum likelihood estimates zero, which means that it's essentially the same problem as estimating a, a logistic regression for us. In addition to that, as you may know, in the case of uh, small networks, most of the time, the samples that we have is, is not a single network, right? So we have a bunch of them. For example, you can have a, you may be doing a study in which you have families, so you have a bunch of families. In our case, we have teams, we have a bunch of teams, and you may also have, for example, ego networks, right? So you may have a bunch of these small networks at the same time. And because of that, it makes sense to think about pool estimates when you are uh, estimating this kind of model for a small network. So this is how the likelihood function looks like in the case that you have multiple networks, which is essentially just having the, the product of all, of all the, the, the likelihoods of each one of these small networks. That's exactly, it looks like, it's, it's a cycle. Oh, the point is less important here. So that's exactly the same as you will do again in a logistic regression. So we are kind of reducing the problem to a logistic regression a little bit. And the thing is that, so how is this different from the no, normal way to fit ergons? Okay? So we actually, this is the, the way that we fit ergons when, we, when we're using MCMC, right? In the case of small networks, actually what we do is, is this. Instead of doing MCMC MLE, we just do MLE. We make an initial guess of our parameter theta, and then while the model, the model doesn't converge, then we just update theta using a Newton Raphson step, which is a very like normal way of estimating this type of model, like logistic progression. And because of that, when we skip the MCMC part, the benefits that we obtain are we are able to get MLE estimates directly, okay? Which also implies that we also can get the variance covariance matrix directly estimation. We avoid the generative problem completely when you have MCMC. And finally, which is more important, we obtain more accurate, actually we obtain exact estimates 
faster. This is really faster because you, you, you may be aware that if you're trying to like, I don't know, most of the time when you when you estimate ergoms, it might take, I don't know, for bigger net, net networks, it might take a minute or two, I don't know, so it, it's not something straightforward. With this, you can get it actually fairly, very quickly. Sometimes in a fraction of a second, so very, very good. And we have estimated, we have implemented all of this in the Ergomito R package, okay? So before con we continue, actually, we need to make a detour, a sidetrack. Why Ergomito? So Ito, Ita is from Latin, uh, actually, older Latin, Iatus, which is a suffix in Spanish which is not small or uh, affection, okay? So for example, it could be, que lindo este perrito, which means that, that, what a beautiful dog, right? Me darías una tacita de azúcar? Will you give me a little cup of sugar? Uh, so it's a, it's a fairly common word used in, in, in Chile, especially, I'm aware. So for example, I, when I hear that, I, 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 can, I can't avoid thinking of my mother-in-law because she talks like ito, everything. Tomatito, salsita, ito, 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 all the time. So, and, and actually, and this name, it wasn't an idea of us, so it actually was George Wagner who, during the NASA in 2018, he proposed the name after we told him that we had an issue with the name because the first name of this is, it actually, it wasn't Ergomito, it was Largon, from Little Ergon. But it turns out that there's a model that's called, uh, what's the name of it, uh, Longitudinal Ergon. So we can't use that, so now we stuck, we stuck to Ergomito. Okay? Okay, some of the features of this R package, which, by the way, is still in an experimental stage. So it's built on top of StatNet's Ergon package, so it's not from scratch, okay? Uh, it allows many ergon for, for small networks, less than seven, perhaps six, and I'm saying perhaps because it, it might depend on your computer, right? So if it, it doesn't overflow. This MLE implements the full ergon models directly and includes the simulation function for efficiently drawing samples from small networks by, and by efficiently, we actually mean very fast, okay? So here's just a brief example. We're going to show this later on with the, in the workshop, but Here's a data set that I simulated using the Ergometa package that's called Five Nets for obvious reasons. Right? That's how you load the package. That there's, that's the data set. And this data set actually is annotated. So we have uh, each network has males and females. And the, the parameters that we were used to simulate this graph were number of edges uh, so, uh, and um, uh, homophily and gender. So that's why you see this structure. Right? So you see like a men cluster here a little bit. So and this is like split as well, so this is completely split. So that's why we see that those structures, because we actually build it that way. And these five nets are actually just uh, statnet objects, right? So these are just network class objects with, with a female attribute. All of them are hard for vertices, by the way. So the thing is that how can we feed an ergometer with this five to these five networks only? Well, you do it the same way as you would do it with ergometer. So you just type, instead of Ergon, you type Ergomito, and then your model. Five nets uh, uh, equals edges plus no match female, which is what we're trying to model here, model here right? And uh, regarding the, what, what terms can you use, you can actually use all the terms that are available for, uh, in Ergon, because we are using an underlying function that I don't know if a lot of people is aware of, but they have a function that's called all stats count or something like that that actually lists all the possible uh, structure and tells you what's the distribution of all these, of the statistics given all, uh, in all these small structures. And as you can see, this is how the estimates look like. So again, I told you that edges and, and homophily and female were used to generate this graph, and they are significant, as, as expected. So, so yeah, so it's working, okay? Now, the, the thing is that, so since this is kind of, kind of new, right, so we wanted to make sure that we can actually use them, and these are, these are a good way to uh, do science. Sorry. So in order to, to do that, <coughs> we did a simulation uh, study in which we simulated a bunch, I mean a bunch of networks. Sorry. And by that, what we did is that we simulated teams, just like the one that we have, which is 42 teams of between three to five individuals. But uh, for this, what we did is that we, we draw param position parameters for uh, actually for edges and for mutual for the edges and mutual parameters from a piecewise uniform distribution with those values within those values. 
once we have the model parameters for the population parameters for, for, for that particular sample, what we did is that we, we said how many, uh, what will be the distribution in terms of the group sizes. So, uh, so we draw this from, uh, from a Poisson distribution with parameter 10, which means that on average, every team that we generated, so every sample that we generated had about 30 networks for every sample, okay? And once we did that, so we, with, the, with the sizes of each group and with the model parameters, we, we simulated random ergos, random graphs using in, in each one of things on, on, on this team. So in other words, for, so for each sample that we generated, we figure out how many teams we will include it, we figure out what will, will be the parameters, and with those two things, we actually generated the, the number of teams using uh, ergos. And we simulated 100,000 of those which should be impressive because I'm, I'm talking about three million networks simulated from an ergo model, which is not common, right? Because what I've seen is that when you use uh, uh, EpiModel, I don't know if you ever use EpiModel. No, EpiModel is an, is an R package that's part, part of StatNet that essentially allows to simulate uh, processes, processes in which like both networks and, and um, outcome effect uh, it work together, right? So for example, they use it to model uh, Diffusion of H H HIV, but every time that they simulate a network, they kind of I don't know they simulate like a, a hundred networks every time. So it's like here we're talking about uh, three million networks. Okay, and once we did that, so for each one of these hundred thousand samples, we estimated the ergon to try to see if we can actually recover the the parameters. In this case, again, so it's edges and number of mutual ties. So just to tell you that the MLE estimates are unbiased, I won't show those results here, but they are doing well. So you can, you have, you'll have to trust me only, okay? <laughs> but no, if, if you want to see it, I can show you later, but, but it's, it's, it's behaving unsuspected. And what I'm showing here is just the distribution of the, uh, the empirical power of our simulations uh, given uh, effect sizes. So for example, in the in this uh, quantum, what we have is that for an effect size of either H or uh, a mutual between 0.5 and 1, these are the power levels that we obtain. So, for example, if you have 30 to 40 uh, nodes, you get a power about 50% for the mutual parameter. And here it's almost like, I don't know, pretty close to 100 for the edges parameter. But what's interesting, for example, if you take a look at effect size between 1 to 2 and you have, I don't know, between 30 to 40 networks, you have 75% power to recover the mutual ties parameter, which is great. It's very good. That's exactly what we have right now, actually. Okay. Uh, so, I, let me clarify again. Effect size in point. point. What is? What are those two numbers in the in the? It's the range of the effect size. So I, I split oh, okay. it. So all the the ergon estimates that live here are for effect sizes of that magnitude. Oh, okay. That we're generated with that magnitude. And then the x-axis is? It's showing you the distribution of the number of uh, networks per sample. Okay. So for example, again, if you have, if you have, you, know, you run an experiment in which you have between 30 to 50 teams, networks, this is your effect, your uh, power for this effect size range, which is very high, right? The tail of that, for those of you who notice it, kind of looks funny. But that's because we don't have enough networks in uh, uh, samples in those points. So that's why we are not able to recover very well the parameter. But that's, again, so that's just, uh, it's misrepresented because of too few observations. Does this graph make sense to you? No? Yes? So is the assumption here that ergometer is best suited for estimating parameters based on a number of small networks as opposed to a single small network? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point, yeah. So ideally, uh, if you have a single network, you might not be, do very well. You can get an estimate of that. You might get significant effects. But the thing is that uh, you can, the, the best way to leverage a small network is actually to pull them together. We don't do that with ergons usually because uh, as, as, as you start adding networks to it, you actually, the computational time starts to increase and becomes like more hard to do. But in the case of small networks, it's very straightforward. And since the data that we recover actually, it's 
just like that, we have a bunch of small networks. You can just compute the full estimates here. Yeah, so that's kind of like a shift of paradigm, right? So because you always think about estimating a single network at this, uh, like in a model, here we are pulling them all together at the same time. Right? Make sense? Sorry, are you going to talk a little bit more about how pooling works? Or could you? Yeah, so in, in what sense? Or what's your... Like, what is... I mean, is it like... Yeah, like, in what, what, sort of, what are the assumptions? What are the... Uh... So the main assumption when you do pooling estimates is the same as when you, when you have, I don't know, N observations in a logistic regression. When you estimate a logistic regression, you're assuming that each, are, each and every observation are independent from each other, right? In this case, when we're pulling uh, ergoms, what we're assuming is that they are different from each other, so independent from each other. Like, for example, in a lab setting, each one of the teams that we invited, they didn't interact with, them, with, with, with each other, so we know that they're independent. And also, so that's the first assumption. And the second assumption is that you're assuming that the data generating process, the parameters that drive each one of these networks, is shared across all of these networks, right? Which, again, is the same as in a logistic progression. When you are getting a logistic regression model, or a linear regression of a, of a map, uh, you're assuming those two things, exactly. So that your observations are IID. In, the case, in this case, the networks are IID. And that all of your observations should share the same data generating process. Does that answer yeah, your question? Thank you. So this is, not, this is very similar to, even if you're doing <coughs> urban, you essentially can put networks on the diagonal and then simultaneously estimate. Yes. Assuming that there's homogeneity of the underlying exactly. process. Exactly, yes. That, there'll be, it's, it's equivalent to, to that. I'm not sure if you get the exact same estimates, um, but yeah, in principle, it's the same. It's, it's what everybody tries to do, right? So it's trying to estimate a block diagonal model. I'm not sure familiarized with that. So when you have a bunch of small networks, what you do is that you try to put them in a single big adjacent matrix, and then you uh, put constraints without it that they cannot be connected to each other, but within they can, so and instead of that, this is better. Right? Okay, so now we can estimate ergons for small networks, right? That's that's cool. At least I, I think it's cool. <laughs> it's too close. Um, so the thing is now, so going back to our research problem, so what can this tell us about these 42 teams that we have? Okay? So we estimated a bunch of models, uh, of course, uh, asking the sensible questions, uh, not any, any type of questions. Uh, and this is what we obtained. So for each one of these three networks, uh, we observed some important patterns for first start. In all of them, the, the edge parameter is negative and significantly negative, which means that uh, networks are sparse. Social networks are sparse, right? Which we know that. Right, we know that's such a number of housework. But we also see an interesting pattern that, uh, that is transitive triads. So in, in, in other words, the balance term uh, has higher prevalence in these networks than, of, than, of, than by chance, which is very interesting. And this result actually uh, goes in line with the things that we have found, with the other things that we have found in the area. Balance is important. Another important uh, result here is that in the case of um, individuals who have High score in the read the man in the eye parameter, in the read the man in the eye test, have a higher chance of receiving ties. In other words, in the, in the case of the advice network. So, in other words, individuals who are, like, I, I don't know, are good at reading the mind, <coughs> they get more uh, ties uh, nominations from the advice seeking network. Which is great because, in this case, so, uh, uh, as far as I understand, uh, the reading the mind, read the mind in the eye, like a skill, you can actually train that. So if you wanna, if you have a small team and you wanna enhance this, that some individual uh, gets more nominations, you can actually train that on hey man, you should get more, uh, uh, you, you should get, you should get more nominations just because of having that particular skill. Another thing that we found uh, is that uh, females, in the case of the advice seeking network, they tend to send more ties. So they are they look for more for advice more often than men, and uh, so that that wasn't significant. I'm sorry, uh, and and very interesting, but actually uh, expected result, but what's the word? Um, unfortunate result at the same time is that 
In the case of the leadership networks, we observe that females tend to receive less ties than men. Right? So, so far, this is what we can say about these teams we're working uh, on these uh, models. We have tried adding other statistics as, such as GPA, religiousness, age, ethnicity. But actually, in, in the case of GPA, we, we did some tests, and in some networks, that turns out to be relevant in the sense that individuals with higher GPA tend to receive more ties. Okay. So, everybody with me? Yes? Do you think this is cool or it's kind of not, not that cool? I think it's cool. <laughs> I really like it. It is cool. Yeah, right? <laughs> Okay, so let me see. I have a question. So sure. you said like 45 teams. Why like the number of networks are like 38, 41, 38? That's a good question. I, I, I hope nobody catched that. No. <laughs> no, the thing is that here it's just because of uh, missing data. No. So in some cases, individuals didn't answer the question. So instead of me trying to impute information, I just dropped it. We have 42 networks, so most of the time we get, we get all of them. But that's why, essentially. But I also, so I, I think I, so I think I did run uh, uh, ergometer as well, excluding networks of size three to see if that would change the result. Thinking that maybe networks that are too small are not very interesting, but actually they, they, they kept being significant still. So, which shows that the results are robust actually. Were any of these 38, 41, 38 null networks? How's that? No ties. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe, I, I'm not, actually I'm not sure, I'm not completely sure. We do observe some uh, uh, like empty networks. For example, there's a, a network that's called a dislike network. So we actually ask them directly, so who do you dislike? Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, people, even though they may not like them, they still don't nominate them, I guess. <laughs> but we, we do observe some. We are very familiar with that problem. We have that problem a lot with our networks. Yeah. We have hindrance networks and dislike networks, right. very, many of which are empty. Right, right. right. But the thing is that when, and, that, and because of that, it's, it's a good idea to actually to pull estimates when you have that kind of data, right? Because otherwise, uh, the, the argument for an empty network is meaningless, right? Okay. So how are we in time? Okay, we have 15 minutes left, so I think it's plenty. We'll see. <laughs> the second part of the talk is actually I think that it's been, uh, I've been very interested on, so uh, to tell you this anecdotally, the thing is as follows. So, Professor De La Haye, when I joined her team, she was trying to estimate these small ergoms, and she failed miserably, but then I told her, okay, so we can do using exact statistics, and, and it worked. So, that's great. But then we were thinking of, okay, now that we have these ergoms, so how can we use this information to actually inform the performance of the teams to use that? Because at the end of the day, that's one of the one of the key questions is to see how do the structures of the network are associated, if any, if, if any association with the outcome variable. So I understand that Professor Contractor, they, 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 what they, they have been doing is that they try to fit one ergon per, per, per network and then use the C-scores of the, the parameters to run a regression model, which we haven't tried, but I think that, that, that that's a good approach, and especially now that you can actually get the exact like the true uh, estimates. Uh, but we were thinking if, if there's any other way of doing this, but to try to like a, take food, like a, say that the, what's the word? Uh, to completely grab what we get with the arguments, so to fully use them. And the thing is that we, we thought about something. And I think it's interesting, but it's still like, uh, an idea that's been work in progress, but I, I just want to share it with you. So if you have any ideas, how can, how can this be improved? So this is the thing. So for testing effects on social network structure of, of, of social network structure on good performance, we see in general like two approaches, right? So one is running linear models like GLMs, for example, right? The problem with this is that sample size is usually problematic, right? So in the case of our our study, we, we made we were able to get 42 networks, but if you want to get enough power, you need like I don't know, like 100 or maybe more of them to actually get enough power to say something. But we know that that's, that's actually very costly, right? So dedicating the time and the, the money, the effort to do that is very, very complicated. If you don't, if you don't like that, then you can try permutation-like tests, right? For example, you can do a simple permutation test in which you take, for example, a network statistic, think about transitive triads, and then you want to see if that's associated with the outcome of the group, which in our case is collective intelligence. 
So you have these two vectors, and then you permit one of them thousands of times and compute some correlation statistic to see if these two are associated, right? So that's a permutation test that you could do. But the problem with that is that we are not controlling for actually anything. So when you're doing that kind of uh, like a simulation, it's kind of like, so yeah, my advisor doesn't like this term, but I think it's kind of like doing free fall, right? Because you say, so here's the variable, I just like, I'm going to like move it around without controlling for anything. So which for a social scientist, I, th I don't think it makes much sense. The other way could be doing some rewiring tests. I don't know how many of you have, are familiarized with the rewiring tests? One? Okay, so the idea in a rewiring test, so, and, and here's a paper that is very good at, at explaining that, is that uh, you want to test, for example, if the network itself is, uh, if you want to generate random graphs, what you essentially do is that you take the adjacency matrix of the network and you start moving around the edges, like shuffling them around. Okay, and you can do that in a meaningful way. For example, you can preserve the number of ties, or you can try to do what's very common, commonly done, preserve the degree sequence of the network, which means that you move the edges such that every, for every move that you do, the in degree and out degree of all the nodes is kept the same. Does that make sense? So you will be changing the structure, but the individuals who receive a lot of ties will be still receiving a lot of ties in this new rewired graph. Okay, so people do that a lot, but the problem is when you have, uh, so one, the first problem is that this is actually an oversimplified assumption about the data generating process. So when you do that, you're essentially saying that the only thing that matters is the degree sequence, which we know it's, it doesn't. It's not the only thing that matters, right? We know that homophily matters. We know that, I don't know, um, reciprocity matters. Balance matters sometimes. So that's an oversimplified assumption. And worse, in the case of our small networks, when we have only four nodes, how many ways we can actually rewire that small network? Not many, so we don't get enough power, right? Okay. And by the way, so I'm going to go into a, a bad place, I think. Uh, I, I don't know if this is wise for me to do it, but I'll do it either way. So when we talk about degree sequence, actually this leads us directly to scale-free networks. And as you may know, this was a very uh, conflicted issue last year, there was a tit for tat set of papers and blog posts and stuff, right? So, but I actually want to rescue Carl. Are you referring to the Aaron Closet? Exactly, okay. so the Aaron Closet's paper on the tripping, which actually was just published in Nature. Nature Communication. Yes. So, uh, the idea is, so he said, okay, scale three networks are rare. So that's, that's the title of the, of the paper, but I'm not focusing on that. So what I'm focusing on, this is part of the conclusions he says, he said, the structural diversity of real-world networks <coughs> presents both a puzzle and an opportunity. The strong focus of the scientific literature on explaining and exploiting scale-free patterns has meant relatively less is known about mechanisms that produce non-scale-free structural patterns. So in this, I just want to comment, I was talking about this with my advisor, and because he's not a network guy, uh, but when I, when I told him, yeah, I want to include this about the scale-free networks, so you know something about that? He told me, uh, yeah, so that's the thing that everybody is obsessed with, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and the thing is that, uh, and, uh, for example, those with degree distribution benefit by a log normal distribution. So, to, and here's the, the key part. So, two important directions of future work will be the development and validation of novel mechanisms for generating more realistic degree structures in networks. In other words, start doing this uh, rewiring with degree sequence presenting so you can get your scale-free networks and do something that is more meaningful, right? And that's what we actually do it right now with this method that we're going to be proposing. Okay? Again, so the idea is, so what about using ergonomics instead to generate null distribution? So even for small networks, we can generate thousands of unique graphs of, for, so sample size here is not a problem. So for example, if we have four nodes, I think we have about 6,000 possible configurations. We have a lot of them. Isomorphic configurations, or just total number of configurations? Total number of configurations. Or many of them would be isomorphic. Many of them may be isomorphic. But when you mix that with attributes of the nodes, then, then it's not. Then yeah. it's broken. Right? Yeah. So as a difference from permutation tests, the ergons provide a more meaningful, realistic way of actually generating the data. Right? So we are not just fixing the degree here. So we are, we are actually doing something that looks like more like reality to what we observe. 
And on average, this is a nice feature, the network that will, you will be sampling will look like the original graph. In other words, so if you feed in an argon in which the, I don't know, the, 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 the term tri uh, number of triads is, uh, I don't know, five, every network that you will like be sampling will generate, uh, in, on average, uh, five triads. On average, right? So, so with that, we're giving this more wiggle room. In the sense that we're not fixing, for, for example, we're not trying to generate graphs that all of them have the same number of triads, all of them have the same number of nothing. We're mm -hmm. actually giving some space to vary that, which actually makes sense. And again, so this, is, in principle, will be equivalent to do a, a revised version of a rewarding test, but with more wiggle room. Okay? So, how's the algorithm? I have three slides explaining this in three different ways of how, of how you can capture it. I, I, I myself, I'm, I've been having trouble to see how can I explain this in a, in a better way. Okay? But we'll get there. So, the idea is that you have your data, right? And you want to do this test. So, you want to compare the network structure to some outcome variable. So, what you do first is that you go and estimate fit an ergon, in our case, an ergometer, right? So, and with that, you will get your data generating process because you will have the parameter estimates. Then we can, we can calculate the value of an observed a test statistic. For example, it could be just the correlation between number of triads and its outcome variable. For example, that could be your test statistic. And now comes the fun, the fun part then. For, for example, say a thousand times, you generate a thousand new samples from these observed graphs for each, and in which, for each one of the graphs that you have in your, in your sample, you draw a new random graph from the fitted argon. Okay? You do that, and with this new sequence of like a, a new graphs, you calculate again the correlation level between, for example, number of triads, <coughs> which now change because you simulate a new networks with your outcome variable. And you do that, at the, I don't know, a bunch of times. And with that, what you end up getting is that you end up, you will be having a null distribution for your test statistic, which you can use to do your hypothesis testing. Can I ask a question? Sure. But it all depends on which particular configuration you use for the test statistic. Here you have used triads, right? Yeah, so triads is just an example. So you can use node match or uh, whatever other uh, statistic that represents the network. And so you're doing that, so that becomes your independent variable then? Oh, or yeah. So performance? Or so so, so the main assumption here is that uh, under the node, we are saying that the outcome of the graph and the graph structure are independent, right? Mm -hmm. And because of that, we can actually resample from the graph structure and, and pair it up with the, with the observed outcomes because we're assuming that these are uh, uh, independent to each other, right? So that's, that's the whole thing. So that said, if, we, if, if it happens to that, if, it, if we happen to see that when we do all the simulations, uh, our test in the distribution of the, the null distribution, our test statistic is far away from what was simulated, then we say that it's not, it's different, it's more or less frequent than, than as suspected by chance. Okay, so here is a, a more like a, 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 another example. So here's an example of this, an illustration. So suppose that we have three networks, okay, of sizes four, four, and five, respectively, okay. And again, so when you have when you feed ergometers, you can feed them uh, using networks of different sizes. So in step one, you would take your networks to an ergometer, which would give you the data generating uh, uh, function to use for the simulation later. Then you can using these networks again, the, the observed graphs. On the observed outcome variable of your group level, at the group level, you can calculate some statistic, which could be, for example, a correlation or something else between some uh, network, uh, some some statistic of the graph. Again, it can be number of triads, number of neutral size, number of homophilic size, so on and so forth. And you you get your your observed test statistic. And then for the for the simulation part, in each one of the iterations, what you do is that you draw a fully a fully new set of these graphs from the data generating process that you assume, which is the argon. And as you can see here, for example, I, for the first graph, what I, 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 I obtain a new graph that doesn't have this link, oops, but has the previous one. So it doesn't have this link, but has this new link. Here, all the other links went, went off, so this is a new link, and this is a new link here. So the long story short, you're generating 
graphs that uh, look different from the so have a different structure from the original one, but but actually share on average the same the statistics that you used to fit the argon with. Does that make sense? And with that, you will have a, a null distribution for this for your test statistic. So here is actually in the last couple of minutes that I have. Here's actually an example uh, uh, in R using like simulated data. So let's go back to our five nets example. We know what's the data generating process for our five nets because I did it that way, right? So we know that edges and homophily on female are the terms that are important for these networks because we did it that way, okay? And suppose that, again, so this is the part that we don't know as researchers, right? But so imagine that this is how the, the, outcome, the output variable was generated. So the outcome is just a function of here's the, the null echo female. So this is the number of ties that were sent to, uh, to female uh, uh, teammates plus some error terms. <coughs> okay, so that's your all variable. Okay, so that's what we're going to try to see if it's associated with, with, not the, with the outcome. And our test statistic will be just be just the correlation between this all variable and the actual parameter that we just used to generate it, right? Because we went, we went, it's, this is just a, a concept of proof, right? We want to see if yeah, this is giving us like sensible result. Okay, this is how the data looks like. Okay, again, so you, here is just the argon statistic. This is the number of uh, ties that female receive. Okay, two, one, two, zero, one in the in the networks one, two, three, and five, one, two, three, four, five, and this is the outcome variable that we just generated using this random uh, data generating process. Okay. So we want to see if these two are associated. So the first approach will be just running a linear regression, right? So we can just run a linear regression with that, or I, we can also, or we can actually do uh, our test. So in the case of the linear regression, the model will be something like this: you regress the, the y variable against the vector of observed statistics, right? Plus a constant. So you, you're trying to fit that. And we want to see essentially if this parameter is significant. In our test, we'll be trying to see if the correlation level is significant. Okay, so how do we do that? So here's just the outcome, uh, the output of the results. What we observe here is just, this is the null distribution generated with our test. Okay, and here is the, actually uh, the value that we observe uh, in, the, in, the, in the baseline data. So as you can see, it's actually different from, from random. Right? I suspect it because we, we did it that way. But in the case of the linear regression, when we fitted this model with the constant, the p-value here was 0.311. Uh, whereas with our model, it was 0 0.045. So in our model, it, it was flagged as significant, while the regression model was as not significant, flagged as not significant. Does that make sense? So that's, that's the idea. So how would you interpret these two, or compare the fact that in one case it was showing significant, and the other case it was not? Uh, I would say that the regression wasn't good enough here. So that's that's the whole thing. Yeah. So. yeah and I, I and I, I was I didn't play that much with the numbers. So actually, I, either I got lucky or the test is super good. But I think I got lucky. <laughs> Can you go back maybe three <coughs> slides where you visualize the rewiring process? Sure. Yeah. This. Um, so maybe it's just. Um, some issue with the visualization, or I don't get it. So, uh -huh. What I see here is that the rewiring happens across the network <coughs> so instead of within the network. So I was just wondering whether this violates the networks are independent assumption. Oh, so that's a good question. So the way that the rewiring works here, since when we fitted the ergon at the first stage, we assume that they are independent, mm -hmm. right? In the second stage, you can just take the, the model parameters that you estimated and calculate the likelihood of, a, of, the, of an ergo model for that single graph. So it's like kind of like extra, ex, extrapolating the, uh, getting out the component of the joint likelihood to a single likelihood model. And with that, you can simulate one at a time. Each one with its own model. But the rewiring is happening within the color, right? Yes. Yeah, so they are not they are not connected to each other. So, okay. so we are we are drawing one new network at a at a, at a time. It's not rewiring. It's not it's not taking one out and putting another yeah. one in. It's okay. just taking one out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And That's the colors are each drawn from a different yeah. distribution. <laughs> that's based partially on the observed. 
Net, like the original network. Like are those three on the right, the red, gray, uh -huh. blue, are, they're not drawn from the same distribution, is that right? No, but so each one of, each one of those distributions share their parameters. Right. How is it? Because when, again, so we fit the ergon, we say that for example, in this case, uh, not the parameter edges is the same across all these networks, okay? So you do the join, the pool estimates, but then when you do the simulation, you do the simulation one network at a time using these estimated parameters. Does it make sense? Yeah, what, what influence does the original, so I mean like the first one has three edges, uh, the blue one, uh -huh. and then, but the, you know, maybe the edge parameter is negative 1.3 or whatever. Right. How does the original edge, uh, like the, influence what the, what the final distribution comes from? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, so that, that makes sense. So the, the idea is that at the end, every time that you draw a new graph from the, from these fitted parameters, uh, the, the sample statistic will be on average the same as here. So if you have on average two ties, you have an average two ties in the, in the drawn graphs. But you also are given some space to get a fully connected network or fully empty because that's, that's how we are doing. So we're we are drawing samples from the entire power set instead of just fixing some number and I don't know, getting all the possible combinations, fixing those. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so this is on average. In the, uh, in the, in the your example of five network, did you check um, when you um, simulated, um, you know, thousand times, these like a uh, uh, average parameter is the same as the original like observed network? That's a good question. Uh, that's TBD. I need to work on that because that's pretty much a, a, a goodness of fit, yeah. which I haven't programmed yet on, on, on ergons, but on ergometers. But that's what you're so. I hope they are because that's that's the whole idea. Because yeah. when you're sampling them, the idea is that you get a, a set of networks that are somewhat similar to the observed one. It should be in principle, but I, if it's not, then it means that I have a bug on my code. So I, I was thinking, I think of something similar in terms of goodness and fit. If you go back to the, or you don't have to go back, but if you can think back to the slide where you were showing the power analysis, mm -hmm. um, what I thought you were going to show there, which is why I think it took me a second, is the equivalent of a goodness of fit, where it's not just the actual, it's not just the links, but if there are some global properties of the network. Like in normal yeah. ergon, they'll do things like geodesic distance uh -huh, uh -huh. or degree distribution. Uh, yeah. And so is that what you're saying you haven't done yet, TBD? Yeah. TBD. Okay, <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but, but in principle, it should, it should be fine. Yeah. Because I've been trying to test the package thoroughly, so every time that I add a function, the estimation function itself, I've been comparing that against Ergo. So, okay, so just let me just jump quickly to the concluding remarks. Okay, so in the, in for the for the ergometers, this is not a new thing, but see, it's just the, the, the tool to do it in a smooth way. Okay, so definitely to keep in mind the preliminary results. Uh, both the simulations and our with our data look very very good. Still work to do. Goodness of fit test. So actually it was right there. And better algorithms to draw random graphs uh, um, randomly. And also some, something that I wanted to do is uh, do some Bayesian models to add some priors to it, which according to my advisor is great fun. <coughs> Bayesian he says that Bayesian are happier than frequencies. Um, also we want to extend this eventually to uh, turgons. Because the idea is that, uh, I don't know how familiarized you are with these models, but the thing is that in, in turgons, uh, we are assuming some independence across the, like the, inter, like the changing graphs to say it's in time. So long story short, we can actually estimate uh, little, little turgons eventually. Should be feasible. In, in the case of the test for association between graph level and outcomes uh, graph structure, we still need to do some simulation studies to explore, explore power and pulse discovery rates. We haven't done that yet. Uh, we also need to uh, develop a little bit more on the, on the code to make it faster and light, lightweight. And also work more on a more formal statistical framework because I actually, I've been trying to do that, uh, but because the idea is not just to stay with the simulation, but actually do that some, to, to see, be able to say when this is a good idea, when this is not, this is not a good idea. And that's it. So thank you very much. Thank you.
I know we are behind schedule, so those who need to leave should go ahead and feel that they have to leave. But those who have questions, yeah. feel free to ask any questions. And those who are going to stay for the workshop are going to take a, take, a break? take a break. Yeah, we'll take a break. Come back. Are Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, hi, this is Leslie to Church. I have a quick question. Hello. Yeah, I can. I can hear you. Should I? Should I speak here, maybe? Okay, yeah, the video is up there. Too. Oh yeah, yeah. No, but she she doesn't hear me. I think. No, the uh, it's all. No, no, I hear you. Oh, okay. I have it. Okay. I can hear you. Okay. So the question. First of all, I thought this was a really interesting talk. Um, my question is, you started off by talking about these different attributes of collective intelligence. Mm -hmm. And what I'm wondering is how you link it. So there's, I heard you talk about it two ways. So in the collective intelligence literature, one way is you measure things like the reading the mind in the eyes. And these are like nodal attribute mm -hmm. variables that if a team has a lot of them, they're more intelligent. And the second way is to administer these tasks which measure different dimensions of team performance right. and look at the ability for that team to do well in those dimensions of performance. Which one are you incorporating in your ergoms? In the ergoms is uh, the first one. So we are using uh, uh, node level attributes. For the okay. outcome variable, so actually our outcome variable uh, for the group performance, we are measuring group performance as the collective intelligence measurement. So we're trying to see, as eventually want to see whether uh, network structure affected collective intelligence. And that's okay. measured and at, that the, at, the, at the network level. Okay, and how do you do that analysis? So in other words, do you take your pooled estimates from the ergmito, which by the way, I love that name, um, and then use them <laughs> as independent variables in a regression? Or do you see what I'm asking? Because yeah. now it's at the team level. Yeah, yeah, so that, that's kind of a, the, the, what the second part was about. So we, we're, mm, we're, okay. trying to, we're trying to do exactly that. So, but instead of doing a regression model, we're trying to do this simulation-based method that uses uh, the ergon itself to draw random graphs. So I think, yeah, I, I, I agree that you showed that to us. But I think uh, you didn't actually show an example of how this with approach our data? can be used with data, with real data. Yeah, yeah, no, how, that's, how I use that's, with, that's with the, that's Yeah, no, so the closest that. thing is just this uh, short example. So, so again, so this is, uh, each row is, is a team. So you have uh, no, uh, statistics at the, at the team level, and then you have your old variable at the team level as well. Which will, in this okay. case, is collective intelligence. But this is simulated okay. data. Yeah, this is simulated data. Yeah. So that's why it's great. So, of course. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Do you think you could do this with nine teams? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I, I actually, I've been, I've been doing this with our 40 teams, uh, but I don't have any results to show right now, but it, it's completely doable. So the only, the, only, uh, the only issue that, the only limiting issue here is the, the, the size of the team. So if you have more than five, it becomes a little bit uh, complicated. But actually, in principle, this test should be applied to any ergon. So if you have a bunch of networks, regardless of their size, you should be able to uh, do this test as well. Oh, but it, wonderful. Yeah. But the other thing also is that, let's say you had uh, 40 small teams, mm -hmm. okay? but you had them in four different conditions. Okay. So you could pool 10 in each of these conditions and then compare across the four. So for example, it could be that you have a, a four person crew that is um, uh, in, go, in sleep deprivation mm -hmm. and another four person, another set of four person crews that are in communication delay, other conditions. Right. So there's right. some environmental conditions that will distinguish between these groups. Yeah. Yeah. And then for each of these, you have say 10 of them or whatever. And now you want to see if, how it affects performance. So that you have performance metrics mm -hmm. in all of these conditions. So, so what you would do is that you will estimate an, a separate ergon for each one of the conditions. Right. But then use the, the estimates to, to run the test all together. Because when you are doing that, when and you what are estimating... The, sam the sample size for the... Est yeah, I agree with you. But then, the, sam then the, the problem with that is that you only have one pooled estimate for the 10 small networks that are in one condition, correct? Mm -hmm. 
how would you then transfer that back to so in other words, you don't want to have four observations. So what if you want to Oh, no, no, so what you do is that you actually simulate the whole 10 networks again. Again, right, and then for each of them. For each one have... of the conditions, you will simulate the same number of networks that you observe. Right. And the cool thing is that if you are using node level attributes, then all the data generating process are kind of like tailored at the, at the group level. Even though you may pull estimates, you will have like a tailored uh, uh, data generating process for each one of them because they have different node different attributes. attributes. Yeah, different distribution of attributes. Yes. And then the independent variables, are they really like sort of just the counts of certain configurations or? You can use uh, pretty much whatever. So this is pretty fairly general. The tests that I described here, I haven't, I haven't like put any constraints right now. But in your case, it's, it's, it's basically the counts, isn't it? It's like the statistics. Right now, it's just the counts. Okay. But essentially, so for example, I was talking about this with Professor De Hey. So what, what you can also do is, for example, if you have enough data, you can, at the group level, you may be able to run a, a linear regression. Actually, actually, so if you have, I don't know, instead of how you have 40 observations, you still run a linear regression within each step, and you, what you get is that you capture the beta parameter. And you want to see if the beta parameters are different from what you observe in the observed data. So in, in other words, instead of just using like a plain correlation, you can use like a more, more fancier right, model right, yeah, within yeah, the, the yeah. framework. So, yeah, so that you, way you control, you control for other things. Because right now, so what we're doing better is that we're actually controlling for something meaningful. But the only thing that we're using to control for is just the network structure of the observed graphs. Right, right. But no more than that. But if you have some other like external things that right. you know that are affected because, I don't know, this group, for example, you, ha you have different tri uh, like, uh, types of groups right. or you right. have, I don't know, you give them something, I don't know. So. But in even that regression, the independent variables coming from the network structure are basically different kinds of counts. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so as long as you are using something related to the network structure, right. then this makes sense. Otherwise, it doesn't. Uh, you just mentioned like a, sort of like team size, like five or six should mm -hmm. be the cap. Um, is there a, like easy way to expand, say like 15 groups or, uh, sorry, 15 person groups or something? Oh. No? Yeah. It's too big. Supercomputer. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's basically two to the power. So fifteen, it would be fifteen times fourteen if it's a directed graph. Yeah. Two to the power of fifteen times fourteen. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Oh, that's sorry. Two to the power two hundred and ten. Yeah, so okay. that's kind of like a big number. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. So unless that, um, I. But yeah. So then the, the the problem goes back to MCMC because I don't think there's a way. Okay. You may be able to do something if you have I don't know eight nodes, but you're using an undirected graph, because that, then the number of possible uh, networks reduces significantly, but other than that, I don't think this is feasible. Okay. Any other question? Great. Well, thank you again very much. Thank you. Well, to predict performance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Cool. Good one. Okay. So, um, just because of Time. I, I realize that I don't have R in this computer, but that's fine. So if you can go to github.com slash gvegayon slash nu2019, you will see the materials of the workshop. I don't know if you have gone go to that website yet. Can you check that out? It's kind of small. So once you get there, if you go to workshop, you'll see the actual workshop right there embedded. It's a website. Uh, but you can, uh, for a start, we actually need to get the R packages for this. And for that, um, oh, actually, I haven't updated this. One second. So for that, you can still go to that web address right there, which is where the Ecomito R package lives. They have there are instructions right there to install it. So, how, what, what operating systems do you guys have? I see a couple of Macs. Is that 
the, the rest are uh, windows. Any want to fun here? No? Or it's just me? Just me, I guess. <laughs> what? I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't take it personal, so. So. See if I got R done. Yeah, so it's done. <coughs> Why? So please try to install Ergomito first. Let me know if it works. So in the case of Windows users, I have a compiled version that should be here. Let me see if it opens. Yeah, so if you follow that link. Uh, oh, it's not showing. Oh, I it's showing. It's not showing that. One second. Have you ever used the uh, package step tools? Any of you? Okay, so if you have it, then you should be able to use to follow the instructions with dev tools. For those of you who don't, you can you can try that do that too. Uh, if not, um, just be a bit patient, and I'll I'll just show you then, and and you can ask me later. So because of time. Yeah, uh, if you could, if you can let me know when you got it, got it installed, it'll be great. Have any of you been able to install Agomito? Yeah. I How many of you have been able to do it? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. If those of you who have done it, if you could help the, the rest who has it, hasn't, I'll be great. I think they. Okay, so I just updated it. So is that is not working? Is it working for you guys? What? Anyone has in having trouble with it? The second one is library first library. Oh, you need library like, dev tools. You, did you install this tool? Like it works? Did this top one, it works. Oh, uh, no, I didn't, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to install that package. Yeah, yeah I'm getting an error with downloading dev tools. Thank you. You want to oh, up, sorry. upload a version of it? You got a, a chance. Hold on. For me, updating it. Yeah. Wait, 
Oh, well, because it's at the beginning there. Okay. Yeah. Can you change one or second? It's, it's not a. Uh, yeah, you don't have to change me. You can interact. Okay. Yeah, you know that there's also a um, last. Uh, it's it's embedded so somewhere. Yeah. Like if you run this one, it's like a practical knowledge. Okay, I, um, I just uploaded a version of it. So in the same website of... Um, sorry. Oh, it's asking me. Uh, I can't install this. That's fine. So in the same, same size as, uh, of, the, of the job, you'll find a file that's called ergomito something.zip. So if you download that, I'm actually going to walk you through it. I'm going to download it, and then if you go once it's downloaded, if you go to R right here, if you go to R. Let's see, <coughs> this. It's kind of small, right? Okay, if, we, if we type install that packages, if you can use that tool, this is the way to do it. Quotation marks, whatever the whatever you downloaded the files. So let me see where I downloaded it. It's here. Oh, so it's C. Downloads. So you type that, you type the, the full path to where you downloaded the zip file. Fingers crossed, I haven't tried this on Windows because I don't use Windows, but it should work. <laughs> and then you type the option uh, repos equals null. So that's a way to install an R package that's binary, but you don't want it to install it from CRAN, you can do it that way. Okay, so it works. I don't know how. I That's think. Fast. Yeah, yeah, because it's binary. So, so we will need also uh, Ergon. So that's that's how you install the Ergon package. You should you should know. So, why am I telling you that? And well, that's going. Well, that's happening. I'm just going to start this, so we have enough time to go through it. Because we have until 4:30, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually. Uh, do you need help? Is it working for you? No. Yes. I am downloading. Okay. Okay. Oh wait. Oh. Uh, yeah. but did, did, you, did you download it? Actually. I downloaded it from Windows. Okay. Is there I... downloads? Okay. So let me try. With the full name of it, so oh. and then repos becomes not. Oh no, you. This is a Mac. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can help you with that right now. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the zip file doesn't work for Mac. Yeah. So because you can you can build it, but the, the problem is that you're not, not being able to. Let me, yeah, let's. Yeah, I think that's I might a, use our uh, yeah. that's that's so problem. You also have a Mac? Okay, so let's, um, let's try this. Follow my instructions. So another way of doing it is to actually build in it. We can, we can, we can, we can check if we can build it. So what we want to do is that we want to go to the Ergomito website. So let's see if this works. Like, can we call your repo, like Ergomito repo? And just build it from our local yeah. machine. Yeah, yeah. If you know how to do that, that'll be great. Yeah, but I have an old version. Mm -hmm. Okay. Could you show me the commands of how to build it in my local? Yeah. So to, to do that, so what you need to do is that you yeah, go so here. I have an old version, so the one that he's working on. You download the repository. So I have an error. Let me try to. Mm, okay. Uh, so so then, let me see. Okay. Because you might want to install. Let me put the test case. 
Yeah, so you you download the repository, so you know how to do it. Pull your repo again to my no, 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 no. You download that. Uh, yeah. And so then you can you go to basically what you see. You have to type the command line. You have to go to the terminal. In the case of uh, in the case of uh, Mac is I think it's a terminal. So then we go there. Downloads. Okay, but like I think that yeah. it's uh, here. So I have it here, I think. Then we can actually, let me see. It's not probably uh, installed in the R, so it's just an install again. Or just close the R. I get two questions. Yeah. You have to go to where, where the, the file is, the folder. So in this case, is. <laughs> Here, I think, here, Gomito Master. Yeah, so here. we have all the data here, and what you type is you type r command install Gomito Master. No, there's no Oh, I don't have r command install. But you know, like when I get yes. your repo and I can't get you, uh -huh. um, and it's just an error to me, right? And I do not see any error to me. Oh, I see. You have to, you have to download it. So you, did you, did you download it that way, like this? Yeah. Uh, oh, you should download it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I clone the repo. Sorry. Yeah. No, but um, I'm afraid that in the case of Mac, this, the, the problem is that you need to, you need to build. The building tools. I, unfortunately, I wasn't yeah, able to so set it up for Mac users uh, I <laughs> right away. I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, but I have all the output there so you can look at it. So what I just want that. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Can you want to download? I don't like Macs. I don't like Windows. Okay. But I understand that some of you have to go. So we'll just. So right now you have this okay. lower version of packages. These packages does not necessarily have the So we're going to be using three R packages. Uh, 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 Ergomito, yeah, Gnet, which that's the wrong address, I need to change that. <laughs> and Ergom, which I guess that all of you have. Yeah, I, I... So the first thing first thing first is um, the Ergomito package has the way that it's built. It, what we explore again is what I was telling you through the talk is the fact that we can actually calculate the likelihood function directly without having to do simulations. So, one of the key parts of the Gomito package is the function that computes the likelihood function. And under the hood, what we are actually using is using this function from the StatNet uh, Ergon package that's called Ergon All Stats. Which, if you try it out, I don't know if you have ever. Do that before. If you try it out, so let me load the package. <coughs> okay. Suppose that I generate a random graph. Okay. Um, let me try to see if it. Loads here. One second, I'm missing one package. This shouldn't have happened. So, because do we have someone on the? Um, are we recording this or anything? You know. You are. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I was thinking maybe just to swap to my computer. Okay. Um, Is that too complicated? Can, no, can we can continue for that. Because that might be easier. Yeah, I thought I thought we have R here and everything. Yeah. It turns out that we don't. That's so. okay. The um. Stop sharing. Here. 
Or maybe we can join the Skype call. Exactly. Okay. So on this computer, what we'll do is if you go to the URL. It's basically an error. An error means it didn't work. No, no, no. I can, um, I'll email you the URL. Okay. URL. Right here. Yeah, in the meantime, so let me just tell you about this. So again, so what we have is that we are able to calculate lightning functions directly using this function. And this function, what it does is that it takes a single network, essentially, and, and it gets the size of it. And you can specify an ergo model. For example, you, you specify a number of triads, a number of edges. And it's going to do, it's going to uh, look at all the networks of that size and classify them accordingly to the number of edges and the number of whatever other statistic you're using, for example. And it'll give you return a matrix that shows you all uh, that information directly. So uh, let me. And with that, it's easier if I, if I show it. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. Yeah. So, um, so I just see your email. Okay. With the blue jeans link. Let's do jeans. That's better. I like that better. Oh, good. Then you should be able to share your screen from here. You can also hook it up to this if you like. Um, no, that's fine. I can, I can go right here. So. Okay. Here I am. Can you, can you listen to me? Oh, I guess that. Should, should I mute my mic here, I guess? Yeah. My mic. Okay, so I'm going to run the phone. And now. And you can um, just share your screen. Okay, so um, can you see them? Okay, yes, I, I can think now. Your... Um, yes. sure. Awesome, okay, that's great. So this is better if we do it this way. Yeah, now that was um, uh, a dry run of the of the workshop. If you go back to your um, a browser, no, your blue jeans, and just turn off your uh, camera. Oh, okay. That way we don't see you here in the corner. You don't want to see me? No, unless you. Like <laughs> no, to I'm, see just, I'm just kidding. Okay. Yeah, I can mute myself. Perfect. Okay. So now that we are here, it's better if we if we show it, right? So I, I guess that all of you use R Studio, right? No? R Studio. R Studio. Mm -hmm. right. That's good. So what, as I was telling you, the way of doing this, um, one of the key things of the so all of this that I'm going to be showing here in R Studio is actually the same as what's online. Okay, so it's the already compiled Markdown file. I don't know if, how many of you use Mark, R Markdown. Have you ever, sometimes? But you, you know about it, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so if you, in the, yeah, whatever I'm showing you here right now is actually the, the, the same thing as, if, as, already, as what's already here, okay? All, all, all the only difference is that it's, it's, it's compiled. Okay, so I was telling you about this function that I find great. That's from the Argon package that allows you to calculate all possible statistics on a, on a network for a given size. So suppose that we have, I don't know, so a library, let me just load the packages. So. Can you make a bigger? A bigger? Sure. Let's do it bigger. Is that better? Yeah. So suppose that we have this network size four, okay? That's the network. Uh, so if we use this function uh, from the Ergon package, it's called 
uh, ergom all stats okay with our network you call it x no, I call it net and I specify a model for example uh, edges what I get oops oops and the oops what I get is all the possible configurations, unique configurations, uh, using only the edges parameter. So in this case, as you can see, we only have 13 of them. Uh, uh, but the thing is that we have isomorphism. So for example, here it's telling you that for, uh, I think it's nine edges, we have 220 matrices, that all of them have nine edges, but in a different configuration. So if, for example, if we add something different, this is showing us how many um, different configurations, mixing edges and, and, and transitive triads are out there of, in graphs of sizes four, right? So, and, and with this, uh, and, and this has two parts again. So this is uh, the, the configuration itself, the, the, the number of edges and number of triads and here is how many of these networks have that configuration. So for example, the first one again, uh, that has nine edges and nine triads is 104. The second one that has only nine edges and three triads is 352, so on and so forth. So we're using that function under the hood in the, in the uh, in our gamete to, cal to actually calculate the statistic. And because of that, we're actually capped by whatever this function can calculate. So if you, if they can do it efficiently up to seven nodes, six nodes or seven nodes, okay? Based on that, so once uh, using this function under the hood, we are actually able to calculate the likelihood function and with that, use, the, use that to maximize the, the, the likelihood of a given observed graph. So how, I'm just telling you this so you have it on, on the back of your mind. You don't need to fully understand this. So this is all available online. But essentially, what the, the what the key point here is that once you when you try to estimate an ergometer model, for example, I'm going to load the data uh, with the five nets. Right. So here, my friend, five nets. When I try to when I type this ergometer five nets, for example, edges. What it's doing under the hood, it first uh, it reads the formula in, then it creates a lot likelihood function together with the gradient function, and then makes a call to the opt-in function from the stats package. I don't know how many of you have seen that before, the opt-in function in stats package. So this is what's usually uh, what's most commonly used for maximizing functions in R. And here are some details on the algorithms that, I, that we use for this. Uh, one key aspect of this, so again, so when, when we're running this model, uh, is that just to make sure, because of, a, of a, an ugly experience that I have in the past, trying to like a, when I was testing this package, I realized that in, in, in a particular configuration uh, for the, the setup of the optimization algorithm, I wasn't getting the same result all the time, which is bad. But that's not anymore a problem, okay? So that's fixed, but the thing is that just to make sure uh, when, when you estimate an ergometer model, you can actually specify how many times you want the algorithm to try to estimate it, right? Uh, if, if you are aware of, I don't know, a structural equation modeling or sometimes uh, when, when you estimate these types of models, you want to try uh, run it a, a, a different amount of times so that every time you, that you start the optimization algorithm, you start from a different point just to make sure that you're getting a global maximum. Does that make sense? Again, we're using MLD, we want to make sure that we get a global maximum, and because of that, I'm doing this five times by default. You can switch that to 10 or whatever number you want, but it, it should be fine, okay? Um, okay, so the, the five networks data that I'm showing you here, five nets, I have right here. Again, this was generated using the ergometer sampler, which we will look later on. In this case, the, the parameters for this model were number of edges equals um, parameter mi minus two, and for uh, homophily of female was point, point 0.2. Okay, and just before 
Find the true model, which is the, the, the one that we're interested on. So we want, I want to show you how, what do we get when we actually estimate these Argomito models, OK? So the first thing is, of course, to load the R package, as we do here, right? just like you would do with any other R package. Then, in this case, I'm just loading the data. OK? You can take a look at, uh, look at it, five nets. So which, we, which is just five different um, uh, network objects from the network package. And to feed the Argomito, you just type this, Argomito, your list of networks, and then whatever the model specification you want to include. So when we run this, we obtain this coefficient, OK? And just like you will do with Ergon, this has a summary method. So if we type summary, model 0, sorry, we will get some more information regarding our model estimates. See? That's the coefficient, the standard error, the z-score, and the probability. Right? The AIC, VIC, the model itself, and some other information. Okay. Since this is a actually very simple model, in, in this case, um, this is just a proof of concept, we can actually estimate this using just a plain uh, maximum likelihood instead of doing like an ergon maximum likelihood model. So this is the, 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 the actual, because this is a, a Bernoulli graph, and in this case, in this Bernoulli graph, set of Bernoulli graphs, the estimate is uh, 0.3333. Uh, and, if, and if you were to do this using maximum likelihood estimation, you can actually do it directly by just computing the proportion of not zero times that you observe in all your data. So as you can see here, when I calculate in this way, so here I'm just, uh, for a start, I'm, I'm just uh, counting here how many nodes I have uh, in this network. Okay, so this function itself returns how many nodes a particular object has. Here, I'm returning how many vertices I have in this network. Okay, so as you can see, I have two in the first one, seven in the second one, so on and so forth. Okay? And with these two, I can actually calculate the proportion of non-zero ties that I observe, which is exactly our uh, estimate from the ergon. See, these two numbers matches, so this is doing what it's supposed to do. Does that make sense to you? I, I think that I understand that Professor Contractor has has shown you examples with this when you when because at the end of the day when you're estimating an ergon which doesn't have um, any Markovian dependencies which means that the ties are are independent then you can just estimate that using a logistic regression right right and when you do that in this case in, in this particular case for a Bernoulli graph it's just the same as computing what's the proportion of non-zero ties okay. So when, by doing that, I just wanted to make sure that what we are getting is actually what it's supposed to be. OK? Um, yeah, and just like the Ergom object, the Ergomito model has a bunch of other stuff. So if you, uh, I don't know if you ever used the, the structure function in R, str function in R. So this is a nice tip. Uh, if, you're looking, if you want to look at, a, at an object in R, how it's composed, you can use the str function just like that. So for example, str, you say arrests. If you can try that for me, I'll be great. I don't know if you, you know, you know this data set, use arrests. It's just a data frame in R. But they use it for a lot of examples. So, if, so let me print it. It's just a data frame, right? But if I type str on the name of the object, it actually gives me a, like a more information about its structure. It's telling me it's a data frame, 50 observations, four variables, and then it gives me a glimpse of uh, its contents. So when we do that with the with the with the output from the Ergomito, we are actually doing the same thing. So this is uh, this is an object of class Ergomito that has all this stuff embedded in. So we have a lot of information. Okay, and all of these things are there because we we use these two for other stuff. So for example. Uh, if you want to make sure that your models converge, you can take a look at the optim out element. So if I type model zero and then use the dollar sign and then type optim out, this is the result that you 
that was returned from the optimization algorithm. And, say, and a zero means here convergence. Okay, so this is telling you how many times the function was evaluated. If you remember when you saw uh, these models using uh, newton raphson you iterate until you reach convergence. Well, in this case, it iterated 15 times. That's uh, the likelihood of function, uh, and that's the, the, the parameter that, that maximizes the function. Okay? And, and there's, then there's another object in this output model that's called the formula, which actually um, it's the, 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 it contains the log likelihood of function. So if you ever need that, you can actually get it from here directly. See? So this, this way I can actually ca calculate what's the likelihood, for example, if I, if I, if I use a parameter 3, that's the likelihood that I obtain. If I use the actual parameter, that uh, was estimated for that maximize the function. That's the one that maximizes the value domain. And the same with the gradient. And the gradient, for those of you who um, know a bit more about this, if you are doing maximization, when you, once you reach the maximum, the gradient should be zero or close to zero. And that's exactly what we're getting, a very small number. OK? And just like in ergon, so when you have your model, you, you can do a lot of stuff. You can compute confidence intervals like this, get the variance covariance matrix, use just a single variable, so it's no more than that. The log likelihood function, AIC, BIC, a summary of your model, number of observations, right? Um, but what if, for example, so I don't know, the, you, you mentioned that some of you sometimes uses Markdown, R Markdown. Have you ever heard about the text rec package? No, you have. Have you? Yeah. So for those of you who are writing your dissertations, you should learn about it. It's it's awesome because it allows you to like output regression tables like very seamlessly, like super easy. So in this case, suppose that we actually estimate five li five different models. Okay. So we have this ergometer with five, uh, for, for the five minutes, but first we use ages and try accounts, then ages and um, not like called female, ages and non match female. Okay. Suppose that we use all of those. So we have three different models, right? With, with, diff, with three different estimates. If we use the text rec uh, package, which you can download from CRAN directly, let me make this a little bit bigger, and you use the HTML rec function, for example, you can pass a list of models that you just estimated, so in this case, I'm just specifying a list that a name list, so in which the first element is just the model zero, which I call baseline. Then model one, uh, I have two baseline models. Okay, I'll re rename it as baseline two. <laughs> okay. Then I call female model two and homophily model three. I think that that's a balance, not the baseline. Right? Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yes, good catch. Okay, so you have baseline balance, I call female and homophily, and then I, you can add a caption. So once you have that, if you type that, so yeah, this is HTML, so you won't be able to read HTML, but if you look at the presentation, um, at the contents of the web, you go to that section, you will see that what we got is this very nice regression table. It summarizes our results and puts it for you. And you can add more stuff, see? <laughs> what? Oh. I want that. <laughs> yeah. Again, it's a text rec package. You should use it. So it also works for ergons. So if you're feeling ergons, so it, it works for ergons as well. So it's great. So I, I, you can change this. So for example, you can type a screen rec if you're old fashioned. Just add that. Here you go. Wow. Uh, if you use LaTeX, uh, you can do that as well with LaTeX, so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, yeah, so long, long story short, the ergometer package is pretty much the same as the ergon package. So if you, if you know how to use the ergon package, then you know how to use the ergometer package. So I don't know why I'm, why I'm doing this, since you already know how to use it. <laughs> That's the idea. Um, so this part, you all get this part, right? And then we have 
a list of networks. So that, 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 um, the other thing is that you can also specify this in a different way. So suppose that uh, you only have three networks. So let me create it from the five nets. Five nets. One. And it's two. Five nets three. Okay? So suppose that you have these three networks and you want to do a, a Nergomito with this. So what you can do, you can just type Ergomito and then list, just like that, like you will do with any list in R, net1, net2, net3, edges, for example, transitive triads. And this should work. See? And it works. So it's very, very straightforward. Because you, I don't know if you're aware, but you, you can do this on an argument. Unfortunately, as far as I know, you can do it full estimates. You can do it here. Just like that. You can either, so in other words, you can, you can create your list out before writing the model, and you can do it inside of the model. And it will work in both ways. OK? We do have, since this is actually pretty fast to do, we do have a way to do to, to calculate uh, uh, bootstrap standard errors with ergometers, okay? Which is included in the ergometer boot function. So you can take any model that you just fit it and then call the function ergometer boot, specify the number of repetitions, and then if you are if you are more than one core, you can use multiple cores to do this. So here I'm using four. A question just about like the pooling. So like if you're using the um, like no level attribute. Do the attributes need to be on the same scale between like networks? So like a dumb example might be um, in one network you have um, gender coded as M and, and M and F, but in another network you have it a binary one and zero. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, it, they should be all on okay, the same scale. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so let me just run this. When we are running this, Again, we're feeding a thousand ergoms, which is not something common, right? You never feed a thousand ergoms right away. And we just did. So that's it, that's the result. And you can get this, you can look at the summary of it. Okay, as we can see here. So even though it's it's included in the package, I don't recommend to use it uh, because I, uh, as far as I understand, the MLE estimates of the variance should be better. Um, in general, since, since we can actually compute them, we don't need to do the bootstrapping. But either way, it's included if someone, someone needs that. Okay, and, and with that as well, so one of the things that this uh, bootstrap gives us, it gives us the, the distribution of sample estimates. So you can take those and do a pretty plot of the distribution of the parameters, bootstrap parameters. So here's just showing you how, how does the edges parameters move when you are doing the bootstrap, right? The same as the, the, the non-match female parameter. This is an example. Okay, so, uh, so anyone has any questions so far? Um, this is just out of curiosity. So how um, does like a geometric uh, terms work? Like it's too small to fit like a geometric. Maybe account. yeah, yeah. I haven't tried it out. I just tried it and it basically returned errors. So I'm. Just oh really? Trying, yeah. It's interesting. I haven't tried it out. What error did you got? Yeah, like four S, four S. I don't know. So, does have you tried adjusting the cutoff on the GUES term? Because by default it does thirty. Oh. <laughs> of how many terms is that? Which three. obviously makes no yeah. sense for. Yeah, put three maybe. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. I haven't tried it. So again, so since we are using the all all stats count uh, or ergom all all stats function, all, whatever parameters are available in ergom should be <coughs> available here. But the thing, so the thing is that the um, the GSW so it's a uh, uh, degree weighted. Uh, edge-wise edge -wise shared parameter, I don't know. Yeah. 
yeah. that thing, <laughs> yes, exactly. the age wise share, share partner, uh, share partner. Yeah. It's, it's not, um, uh, you don't need it, you don't need that here, right? Because the whole idea of that parameter in principle was to overcome model degeneracy, right? right? We don't have that here. So instead of that, you can just use a triangle, which a triangle is always hard to fit in on Ergon. Mm -hmm. Here it fits like straightforward. You can just type triangle and it will work. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In what sort of context would you need to fit the bootstrap standard error estimates? Or like when would it be? To be honest, I'm not sure, but I, I don't think we need that because again, so, um, I just uh, added it because someone suggested to me that it might be useful to look at it. But I don't think you need it because, again, so we, we have the MLE estimates, which means that we have the Kramer Rao lower bound, which is the smallest variance that we can obtain, which is the best. So once we have that, why do you need to do bootstrap? I'm not sure. Might be some other thing going on. I, uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't thought about it formally, but I don't think you need it. But it's just there if you, if you want to use it. So. Okay. Yeah, because the other thing is that if you have a, a small sample, right, so it might be the case that uh, you, might, you might get a full set of uh, disconnected networks uh, for, a, for a given sample in the bootstrapping process, which I, I bet that we did in some fashion. Because as, we, as you can see here, we are getting some uh, these, uh, these estimates here that, that show up here uh, may have to do, I don't know, uh, with very uninteresting samples. Samples. So these are giving very bad estimates. And because of those, the, the standard errors from the bootstrap version are not matching what we are obtaining from the MLE. Okay. Okay, any other question? Again, so this is very straightforward because it's just feeding on ergon. So ergon is the same as feeding on ergon, so it, nothing changes from there. What's interesting is what, what's underneath. So for example, uh, I don't know if you ever wondered how to compute the, the power set. You know, when I say power set, you know what I mean, right? No? No, no, no. The power set is the, 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 all the possible combinations of something. Right? So in other words, uh, the power set of the network of size two means the support of the, of the argon for size two, which means all the possible configurations of with two nodes, right? You have a no, 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 no. So for example, if, if we, and for that, we have this function that's called power set. So if you type that power set two, it will get all the possible, all the networks of size, possible networks of size two, which are, I, I said at the beginning, they're fully connected. I remember that, uh, that we're not allowing for, for, for our Excel loops. They're fully empty, uh, one sends a type to two, and two sends a type to one. So those are the all possible combinations, right? If we do this power set three, We get all the possible combinations on side three, which is 64. If we are doing four, <coughs> it's about 4,000. If we're doing five, it takes a little bit more because it's a million, I think. A million something. Yeah. Right. We can, I can try to do six, but I, I, I'm afraid that my computer might not very, very <laughs> so, so under the hood, does the um, does the argumento, does it calculate all of this like a priori before doing any? Yes, yeah, so that, that that's the thing. So in, in the estimation process in argumento, that's why I put it at the beginning. So let me actually use the the word browser. I think it looks better. So in the estimation process, of all the steps, of all of these steps. What takes the most is actually the first step in which, is, in which we build the likelihood function. Mm -hmm. I'm not using the power set right now, with the, using my, like, my function to build the power set, I'm just using uh, yeah, the statnet all stats function. Okay. Uh, but that's what takes the most. So once you have the, the, the likelihood function, which includes all the possible configurations, then like, the estimation process happens in a clip, in, like, in the print of the eye. Uh, and that's, uh, that's why I have this parameter in the argumento function that allows you to specify how many times you want to try to find, like, to maximize the function. If you, if you put, like, I don't know, 20, it won't change the speed of your estimation process because that's super fast. What's slow is the first part of just calculating the configurations. All right, 
So, um, a question I have, and I don't even think this is going to go anywhere, but something I've been thinking since your presentation. So, if I have um, like the five nets, if like four out of the five nets are like the same configuration, um, does that just mean like based on my model then, um, like those estimates would be like really large compared to not very large? So, if all of them have the same configuration? Yeah, so like, um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna say, so like the triangle, my, my understanding of like the earning parameters, like, you know, you look at one network and then you have the estimate for likelihood in the one network. And then when you pull it, you aggregate that across all these networks. And I'm just, I'm, I'm just curious, is the logic the same um, if you, if like your pulled ones are the exact same, so to speak? The coefficients might be the same, but not the variance. So that's, that's okay. the key part. Gotcha. So actually, it's very interesting because if you uh, do, uh, if you have, if you have five networks, all of them look the same. Yeah. If you do a single, uh, like a, you estimate a network in one, only one of them, you will get some set of parameters. Right. Right. And if you, uh, if you use a full estimate using all these five, you will get the same set of parameters, but the variance will be smaller. Will be more efficient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which makes sense, right? Because you are you having a, a larger sample size, so because at the end of the day, the variance is a function of the sample size. So if you have, the more observations you have, the more networks you have, the, the more efficient estimates you, you obtain. So actually, you, you can you can you can try that. So if you remember, uh, so we have this network, right? So if I do an ergometer uh, with only one network, sorry, what? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. If I use uh, so if I estimate, oh, that's not that. I think it's to try it, maybe, yeah. If I do this, and then I do this again, I'm just repeating the, the network. Oh, that's bad, let me see. See, that, that's one situation in which the number of tries should be increased. I mean, that's interesting, man. Okay, yeah, the, I don't like this. I'm sorry, let me see. Uh, um, uh, More interesting one, maybe. Let's try with two. Okay, yeah, this is working. <laughs> I don't know, I'll so have to check that. So it depends on the network? What? So it depends on the network? Uh, yeah, no, no, so it, uh, it, it should depend on the network. So let me, okay, so if I try to estimate this with a single network, I should get the same estimates, okay? And I do. Yeah. See, but what changes is that if I take a look at the, so that, that's the, 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 P, the P values, right? Using a single network, if I use two, and look at the variance as well. The variance changes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it is. See, and you're getting more power. Okay, thanks. Because you have more observation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's the same as if you have any again like a logistic question. You want more observations, you want more new networks because that way you get more power. Um, I'm just wondering about the uh, uh, multicollinearity in this like like small networks, mm -hmm. like for instance, if you put like so many like different terms, right? Like edge, mutuality, and a triad, and blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. Um, you know, one of them might hit and to explain everything, but like other terms are just like you know, garbage to right, right. do that. Is there like any way to detect like, okay, overfitting, and then like you need to reduce like a number of terms to right. include yeah, I guess, I guess it should be the same way as you do it in a, any linear regression model. Okay. Because again, when, when we're dealing with ergometers, it's just like if you would do like a logistic question, so you're using maximum mm -hmm. right, but which right. is the same principle that you use for all your old uh, friends, right? All friend model friends. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so this is, this is interesting. So given um, that you use the power sets to calculate, you know, um, all the different combinations or configurations. Is there any reason why you don't just do that as soon as like a user loads the library since the package, you know, is designed for up to like six? Right, because it depends on the covariates as well. 
Covariates. Okay. Right, because yeah. if, if, I, if I add, if, again, so if I add the, I've thought about well, the, that. Yeah, the estimates will be different, but the actual ties are the same. No, okay. it, it, it might change because, for, for example, if you're using a node match okay. H, yeah. The set of configurations, uh, like a unique configurations, ah. changes because okay. it's using this covariate. Gotcha. Right? So it's. Uh, Understood. Yeah. Okay, now I see better. Thank you. Yeah, but that's a, that's a good question. Okay. So, what I want to see is this. Yeah. We're looking at these five networks, right? Uh, okay. Oh. And I was showing you then this pretty table. Okay, the bootstrapping and the simulated network. So the power set function returns just that, the power set of whatever number of times you, you sorry, number of vertices you wanna use. And, and here, here I'm just showing you how this grows as the number of times increases. So when you have two individuals, it's only four different configurations. Configuration when you have three is like 64. When you have four is like 4,000 something. So so forth. So this is this grows exponentially. So you have to be careful. If you go above five, then you are kind of in trouble. Okay. Excuse me. Sorry, is that for the network or are you including like the list of networks? That's for the list of networks. Oh, right? sure. Yeah, because I, again, so when 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 you, when you're using the power fun power set function, it returns all the possible configurations okay. as, as matrices, right? Mm -hmm. So. Now that depends on how much memory you have in your computer. Um, and, and why am I bringing this? Because so the next thing that we have is, so we use that function, the power of the function, to draw random samples. So the function new R commito generates, uh, creates a data generating process like a sampling function for an ergo model. So in this case, for example, when I'm using, when I, when I specify here, I'm, I'm telling this function that I want to to create a uh, sampling function that samples from a Bernoulli graph with four nodes, right? Uh, and where the, where the edges parameter is the, the one that generates the data, and I want the edges parameter to be minus one. That's the population parameter, right? So it's, it, we're kind of going backwards. We're kind of, instead of being the model, we're actually pre-specifying what's the actual data generating process of the model. When I show you my simulations, I, this is what I use to create all those simulations. Make sense? So let me show you with, with an example. So ah, and you can also specify the sizes that you want. So when I type that in R, oh no, this is not the one that I'm using. When I type that in R, I go to that section. <coughs> um, okay. The R Bernoulli 4 just generates a random Bernoulli graph of size 4, but then the rest is what specifies the model. So if I type this, okay, I just create a sampling function that will generate ergoms with that, with that characteristic, with, with that, um, sorry, sorry, which one was it? Okay, this one. Here it is. So this object that was returned will allow me to generate random ergoms, random graphs with, with the edges parameter equals minus one. Okay, and how do we do that? Well, you can just type, you can go to the object and then use the dot assign to go to the sample function. Suppose that I want, I don't know, 10 networks of size four with that parameter. All of these networks have the same edges parameter for the data generating process. These are different graphs, as you can see, different configurations, but the edges parameter is the same. Does that make sense? It's just like you, it's the same thing as you, want, for example, if you wanna, in R, when you type R unif, right, and not 10, you're generating 10 uh, uniformly distributed variables, right, between zero and one. Typing sample 10 is four generates 10 random uh, graphs from the same distribution with the edge parameter equals minus one. And how can we make sure that this is, that's the true configuration? Well, we can actually try to fit the models here. We should get about the, about, um, kind of the same. So here first, I'm, I'm setting the seed, right, to, because it's a random process. And then I'm going to generate 15 networks of size four, okay? 
using this sampler function. Okay. So here's how the data looks like. I just sampled 50 networks with that configuration. And now I'm going to feed an ergometer with, that, with these 50 networks trying to estimate the HS parameter. Okay? Are you guys following me? If I do that, I should get something, a, a edges parameter that is close to minus one, because that's what generated the data. And if we do it, as expected, we cannot get that. Does that make sense? We cannot get that, or we can get that? We kind of get that. Kind of, or I think yeah. we cannot. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that looks pretty close, okay. Yeah, so that's, that's the idea. So, so basically the feeder, so whatever number we put, that that's almost close to the, what yeah. this So for example, suppose that you have, I don't know, instead of 50, you have 200 networks of this size. Yeah. You can okay. easily sample them as easily as that, and then no. estimate the model. Might take a little bit more. And it's more, it, and it's closer right. now. So uh, my question way. was the, uh, about this, uh, when you define a sampler, sampler zero, you put the theta at minus one, right? Yeah. So that's basically the, the parameter that we're trying to fit. So if, if we change this, suppose that I, just for fun, minus 1.5, yeah. we do this again, blah, blah, and we try to fit it, and we should get an estimate of close to 1.5, negative. Yeah. And this is the bit that I was telling you, so that, that it's kind of hard. So this is how much time it takes us to generate 200 ergons. Nothing. If you want to generate 2,000 of them, nothing. See? So that's, that's the whole idea. OK? So suppose that we're going to simulate. Again, so all of this part is just for simulating random ergons, right? Suppose that we want to simulate a graph with Bernoulli parameter, uh, sorry, the size 4, but that, that has two parameters, edges and uh, transitive triads, with parameters minus 2 and 1. OK? We just do it like that. There we go. So we have our sampler. Uh, we can simulate 50 networks with that feature from that sampler. And if we try to estimate this ergon model, we should get about, about the same. See, so it's very close to minus 2, very close to 1, which is what we, how we build it. Make it does it make sense? And the thing is that, so the sampler object actually, um, uh, for those of you who know a little bit more about, about R, is actually an environment. So we actually have about a lot of stuff going on in there. Uh, besides of this sample function, we actually have all the exhaustive enumeration of all the networks with that characteristic. So here I have all the networks of size four. And if you take a look at actually, for example, uh, prop, these are the probabilities of obtaining each one of those networks. And this, by construction, some should add up to one. Sorry. Because probability adds to one, right? Does that make sense? So think about the possibilities, right? So the, the whole idea here is that now you have a function that you can use to generate random samples of networks with, with known characteristics. You don't need to like, a, I don't know, like to use a Bernoulli graph. You can use more, you can generate more complex ergons with the fixed set of parameters that you chose. So that's the whole idea of it. How is that different from what uh, StackNet does as part of goodness of it, where it takes a parameter and then generates a, a bunch of networks? It's, it's, not, it's not different. So I think that I'm actually this close to get the goodness of fit uh, because I already have this. Yeah. So I, I can do it. I can do it. I, I can, but I can. doesn't StackNet also take a set of parameters and simulate a, and, and create a set of networks mm -hmm. and the basis of that? So how is this, is this, is this different? And if so, how is it different? So the main difference, again, is that for them to do that, they have to do MCMC. Right. And you are? We are not doing that. Right. Okay. I'm just enumerating all the possible configurations and then using the exact likelihood Got function, it. calculating the exact probabilities of, of getting each one of them. And then I use the simple old-fashioned sample function from R to get my sample. Yeah. It's very straightforward. That's the whole idea. 
Is there an easy way to get the normalizing constant? Like, calculate the value of it? Uh, yeah, I think, I think so. Yeah, so <coughs> we do have the logical function. Uh, yeah, you should be. So I don't have a function to do that because I have it like written within a function in C++. <laughs> uh, but you, you should be able to like uh, to do it directly because you can you can take the uh, essentially you can just take the observed likelihood and multiply that by the exponential times. Uh, let me let me uh, see if I can. Does it make sense? So you go, yeah, go back to the formula, just multiply that by the exponential of the theta time the observed statistic, the target statistic. And that will give you the, the inverse of the normalizing constant. I, I can show you that later if you want. But, right. but you can do that. Yeah, you can you can calculate the normalizing constant. Yeah, so this sampling this is really, I mean, I, I like this because I got, I'm thinking more about it. So the sampling is an example of what I was trying to get to earlier, where you don't need to generate any Bernoulli graphs anymore because you have all of them in your power set. So can't you just like look up, um, you know, just pull a like just sample from the power set and get the same effect? Here? Yeah, if, if you have a Bernoulli graph, you don't need to generate it. You, yeah, this is, yeah, you can. Interesting. Okay. All right, that's all I got. Thank you. <laughs> No, but yeah, so that, that's the right logic. So because we, we can generate the power set, which if you use sample and yeah, any depth from you, from it's just super nulli. Yeah, you can do that as well. So, uh, 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 yeah, I was showing you that. We know how to do this as well. And, okay, so here's that one bit. So this is one uh, limit that we have so far. Uh, for this to be as fast as you saw it, it is, uh, I'm using some functions that I actually uh, took, that I used to uh, copy what, ergon, what terms are available in ergon. So if you use any of these mutual edges, transitive triad, uh, cycle triads, no like cough, no cough, no nice triangle balance, T300, which is the, the, the triad census, the 300 term, and the triad census 102, it should be fast. If you don't use those, then it's going to use uh, Ergon directly to do some calculations, so it's going to be kind of a little bit slower. Okay? That's a drawback, I'm working on that. But as long as you use all, any of this, you're, you're fine. To simulate at least the random networks. For fear, it, it's okay, but for simulating, it's, it's different. Okay? And that said, in that spirit, we also have a function to count statistics. Okay? So, for example, I'll just show you from here directly. Uh, suppose I, I'm generating again the power set of, uh, of, four, of four nodes, and we use the and we want to count how many strategy triads are in each one of these networks. So we have this function that's called count stats, that is a vectorized function that allows you to count uh, statistics fast. So, for example, if I time this, it takes less than uh, ah, like a less than a tenth of a second. It's like a less than a hundred of, a hundredth of a second to calculate. All the triangles in and the transit triads in this, I think it's 4,000, I said, nodes. Sorry, 4,000 possible configurations. But if we use uh, the ergon function summary formula, which is what, what actually, like, like the equivalent, it takes us about six seconds to do the same operation. So it's not bad, but if you're doing a lot of this a lot of time, then it, it, it adds up. Okay? And here, as you, as you, I'm just taking out, I'm just making sure that I'm obtaining the same statistics. So let me show you if I run this in R. I just generated a power set of with four networks. Take, calculating how much time it takes me, and that's it. And and what what it's what does uh, and ends zero hands? Well, it's just telling me how many transit triads I have in each one of the configurations that I just generated. If I do the same. With, uh, with ergon, again, what I get is something that takes a whole lot more time. Right. But, it's, uh, but it's not because these guys are not smart, it's because they, they, didn't, thought, they, they didn't develop it for, the, for that. Are you using like C? For In my case, C, I, I'm using C. So here I'm not doing that because every time that I try to, to like count one statistic here, this is essentially a for loop in R, so they have to turn the thing into a network object, so it, there's a lot of steps which I'm not doing, so that's why I'm faster. Okay? 
And just the last couple of things we, before we finish. Okay, so here is just illustrating how the, the this um, GNET test works. Uh, the, 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 the algorithm that I show you, the, the second part. So again, so going back to the Ergomito, so the, to the five nets that we have, uh, we have this R package that's called uh, GNET. Uh, be sure that the name is going to change because that's not an informative name at all. I'll change that. <laughs> but that's what we have so far, so it is what it is for now. And then uh, what, what we want to do is I'm, I'm here just simulating the actual the, the, data, the same data as you saw in the presentation. Okay, so this is the same example as we had in the presentation. It's just for you to see what what what, what I actually did for, for that. So that's the out, output variable from the team at the at the network level, which I generated using uh, what is it? I think I commented commented here. So it's just using the uh, number of ties. No, in this case, it's uh, uh, the number of ties sent to fi to node or code. How many ties that fem do females send? This is what I'm using here for this. And then I'm simulating this output variable like that. Okay. So what we need for this simulation method, as I was saying in the presentation, is that we need to uh, we are going to simulate a, a bunch of networks from an and ergon to see how what's the distribution of some test statistic. In this case, our test statistic is just going to be the correlation between the number of uh, node or code female counts versus the output variable. Okay, so it's just the correlation between these two. So with this, we define the, the function. Okay, in R. And this function receives a network, or actually a list of networks, and a vector of all of uh, all variables. Okay. With that in mind, then we can call the function that actually does everything, which is called a struct test. So the first argument of the function is the actual ergon model that it's going to be used to generate the data. So in this case, as you see, we're actually using since this is the five nets that I have been working on all the time. I'm just using again edges and not much female of this, which are the, the, the ergon terms that were used to generate this network. Then for the outcome variable, I'm just using y, which is the actual like, outcome variable. And I'm, getting, and, I'm, and I'm going to do these like, simulations 3,000 times. And finally, you have to specify what's the statistic that you want to compare. And actually, this could also be a vector. Of it. So if this is statistic, instead of returning a single scalar, for example, correlation, you can compute correlation in a bunch of other stuff, like multiple, and you can also work with that as well. So once we run this, just need to wait a little bit. But it shouldn't be that bad. So now it's done. We get our result. Test. So in this case, this is a two-sided uh, simulation-based test. The observed statistic, which is the correlation level observed between the node called female and the outcome variable is 0.57, which is expected. This is expected, right? Because we simulated the data from that. But the average of the simulated one is minus 0.11. So in this case, we have a p-value of 0 0.045. Right? So in other words, to use this, you just need to have a network, a, a, a model you want to fit to this ergometer, uh, an outcome variable at the, at the network level, right? And, an and a function that calculates a statistic based on a list of networks and an outcome variable. That's it. And with that, you can apply it. Okay, so we, we can actually, the, the, the test struct has a lot of stuff too. If you see here, uh, this is the observed statistic, right? But then we have all the simulated statistics. So this is uh, the distribution of all the simulated um, correlations. We can actually plot it, right? That's how it's, that's how it's distributed. 
and we can, I don't know, add a other line. Uh, vertical. Yeah, so that's where our observed statistic lives. That's what that's how the it's oh everything else is distributed. This the non distribution. And this is a rather more strict p value because uh, we're actually using like a doubling what we observe. Because the, the, the probability, like the, the portion here in this side of the distribution is actually is not zero point uh, point zero forty five, but It's actually not that number, but actually is something like this, what we're observing. So this is a more strict p-value, but that's just a convention, so that's how it's done. Can you just a chance to the triad, just out of curiosity? To see triads are associated? Yeah. Let's do that. <laughs> let's see. Uh, let's see, so I was defined instead of this. Like that, right? Yeah. Okay, let's see what happens. I'm a bit nervous. So this is work in progress, so be mindful of that. <laughs> okay, test extract. Not significant. Okay. Okay. Actually, I tried that before, so I would like it that you ask exactly what I wanted to, <laughs> someone to ask. <laughs> Yeah, but that's the idea. So we're we're putting more structure to this test, but it's a structure that, as social scientists, we know that exists out there. So I don't know exactly. I, we, I guess we still need to do some simulations to uh, evaluate how much power are we obtaining on the different scenarios and how much false discovery rates are we actually getting. So, but I'm very uh, enthusiastic about this. I think this is, this, this should be very good in general. And I think that that's pretty much it. I'm sorry it didn't work out as expected, the whole thing, because, um, again, so this is um, work in progress. And I will have a compiled version for the Cupertino operating system for the future, which I didn't have right now. So, and I mean Mac OS. <laughs> any question? Yeah, and if you have any comments or something, just let me know. Yeah, I, mean, I think the main, um, so if I'm saying that the main like two or three takeaways here from your work are that one, um, because we're using that work where it's computationally easy to calculate all the combinations, we just go ahead and do the exact, um, instead of like uh, an MCMC thing. Mm -hmm. With this step of it, you're basically doing um, creating some kind of association between network and outcome based on like these simulations across all configurations so that we can know where we're at on the distribution. Okay. Is there any other things, like the main ones you would say, are really unique about the work you're doing? Like main takeaways? Well, I, I guess that you actually got it pretty much also, okay. the, the pretty, much, you know, very, very good. So the, yeah, so the whole idea is that since we're working with these small structures, we can do an exhaustive enumeration and we're just taking advantage of it. And because of that, we can do a lot of things that we weren't able to do before with ergoms. Okay, what about this? What, um, like, doesn't work for, like, value networks, but what about, like, dyadic covariates? Like, um, you know, exogenous networks, like, maybe weighted measures. When you mentioned, like, the age difference is one. So, like, how does that kind of work in this framework? So I have a network and then I want to have like the absolute age difference. Does that go into like the calculation of all the configurations as well or? Yeah, yeah, because, uh, so yeah, it will, it will work for that as well. Because what you're doing is that, I guess, so you, uh, when you're looking at the absolute difference parameter, you're looking at at the tile level. So we're mm -hmm. changing across all the exhaustive enumerations is just the ties where they are located, at, if there are any, mm -hmm. but then the node attributes are fixed. Gotcha. Okay. Understood. Thanks. So I run, this is how you run the test. Here I'm just specifying yeah, so that's the, an association between a network and a graph level outcome. That's exactly what I'm looking that's for. That's the ergo, and, and this is the outcome variable. And here's the function that I'm using to co compute. So this, is, at the end of the day, depends on what you define as uh, the statistic, the, the test statistic. In this case, my, t my test statistic is just the network counts of node of co-female versus the group performance variable. 
What's the correlation between these two? Yeah, in my understanding, like the benefit here is if you only have like two or three observed networks, you know, you just don't have enough observations to make. Right, right, right. So what you're doing is you're taking the observed network, inferring the model that generates it, and then simulating a lot of networks that are similar to the original network, mm -hmm. and then doing the counts. So in other words, you're essentially by counts, do you mean like the test statistics? Yeah, the test statistics, okay. right? Yeah. That's what that's what I mean. The statistics, right? Right. Yeah. So, if, so I think I understand, but just to make sure I agree yeah, with yeah, my, because yeah, yeah. you know I have to teach this to yeah. students, and so I want to make sure that I'm doing this accurately. So, um, in the real world, you only collect data maybe from say ten groups, so five, mm -hmm. eight, ten, whatever. But that's I mean, if you have ten observations and you count the statistics on those ten. And with the performance, then your n is 10. Yes. And that's pretty small. Pretty small. So one, so what I, tell me if this is reflecting what you're saying. What you're saying is, I'm going to infer a model using this ergometer to be able to see what is the underlying model that is generating these 10 networks. So best generates these 10 networks. Yes. But now that I have that model, in place of collecting actual data from a thousand other networks, I can use the model to generate a thousand other networks that should be very similar to the ones that I observed because they are being driven by the same underlying ergo. Exactly. And now my sample size just, but then the, in those cases, you don't have the performance for those thousand groups. So how do you then? You're pairing them up. Pairing them up. So that's the idea. So in each, again, so we are going to simulate a, a thousand new samples, right? By just simulating the networks. And in that case, so for each one of the samples in each one of the steps, suppose that we have five networks, that's the observed mm -hmm. sample, five mm -hmm. networks. Mm -hmm. We're actually going to simulate, again, five networks for, for, for that step and pair those five generated graphs with the five observed outcome variables and compute the correlation between these two, for example. Then, so you get one correlation at, at, at that sample. Then in the next step, when you do again the same thing, you again simulate five other different networks, but again, still five. And you pair these new five networks with the observed outcome variable. You compute the correlation, you get a new. System. When you say five networks, do you mean a five node network or five separate networks? Five separate networks. So, you, so, so that's the have... original observation, right? That's... Yeah, yeah. Okay, gosh. So it's a thousand replications of. Of your sample. Of the of... sample, which is an arbitrary number of networks. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. But then you are keeping the performance, the outcome is only the empirical outcome. For exactly. each of those. Exactly. Because I think so. It's, it's pretty similar to when you do permutation tests. When right. you run permutation tests, right. you fix one of the columns, right? You, have, you fix yeah. your y and you permute your x. Here, instead of doing a permutation, we're actually simulating the x directly using right. the error box. And then you are averaging the correlations across each of those. I mean, so for example, you generate, let's say you generated a thousand networks. Mm -hmm. But is this a thousand for each of the five, or a thousand two hundred for no. each of the five? Think about the, the, uh, how many samples, new samples I generate. So I generate a thousand new samples, each one with five networks, because that's the, the, the original sample size. So and you compute a thousand correlations, then, because for each sample you're going to calculate the correlation level between whatever statistics you're looking at and the outcome variable. So those five networks that you are, that generate, the thousand that you're generating, for, a thousand samples. samples of five networks, those five networks were giving, a, but did those five networks each have their own ergometer estimates or did you compute a single ergometer estimate based on those five networks? I compute a single ergometer estimate based on those five networks, Okay. but then to simulate them you can use like a, a do it one at a time using instead of like a full uh, ergon, a single ergon for each one of them. Okay, so they will then look, um, those five networks will look somewhat similar, but not exactly. Yes, they will look similar to each one of their like a parent networks. Right, if you right, call right, them. right. And then you're saying, but by the way, uh, I, I'll hold on that question later. So then you're doing, you have thousands of these five networks, but for each of those thousand of these five networks, you're looking at the counts of the statistics in these, the test statistics in these, Five networks, yeah, and correlate. I do either a regression or correlating it with some group outcome. Exactly. And then when you get, let's say you did a regression, regress the group outcome on these five, okay, mm -hmm. for each of the thousand. So now you have a thousand regression coefficients yes. for each test statistic. Yes. 
And how, what do you, how, you aggregate those thousand regression coefficients for each test statistic? No, I look at the distribution of it. You look at the distribution of it. Yeah, okay. so I compare that distribution, which is my non-distribution, to the original baseline uh, coefficient of my baseline regression. Before running all the simulations, I, I just compute the regression model of the observed networks. But that regression model would be only based on five observations. Yes. But that's what, that's why it's, it's meaningless, right? Because right. You're, 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 like, you don't have. But we're not looking at the standard. We're you're looking at the point the, estimate. Yes, we're just looking at the point estimate. Okay. By, compu by comparing that against the, this whole new distribution that we just generated right. using the ER codes. It's and, like quad. Right, and then you are trying, but you are trying, but in this case, unlike quad, I think, you want the point estimate from the thousands to be close to the point estimate from? It depends on what, what do you want. If you want to show that then the signal. If you no. want to show it is significant, you want it to be like far away, right? So you want it to be different from the null distribution. Same as a quad. <coughs> then it is so, same as a quad. Yeah. So if the observed is like in the bell of the distribution, that would say network that network statistic doesn't matter. Exactly. Or doesn't matter more than random yeah, so or let me, an outcome. Let me go back and here, so for example, here's, here's a, so here's one example that we got that with the simulated data. This distribution is the null distribution that I just generated using this correlation and with outcomes, right? That line there is the the observed statistic of the correlation between the outcome variable and the and the So oh so wait, so the when you're doing those thousands that you're doing mm -hmm. Even though you're using the actual est uh, ergom estimates to simulate those networks, you don't expect those networks to be similar to the observed network? I expect them to be similar in the terms that I use to fit the ergom. So in this case, to fit this ergom, I use a uh, number of ages yeah. and uh, homophily of female. But the statistics that I'm comparing against, uh, so it, it's a correlation between the uh, uh, node they call female, which is not none of those, um, okay, okay, so you are looking to uh, for tests for predictors that were not used to fit the model. Exactly. But what if you want to use as if a predictor used, one that you fit the model with? Then it's more like it's highly likely that you won't want to observe any significant results, right? Because when you are sampling these networks, all of them are going to look very similar to the one that you have as baseline. So, if, for example, if you use triads, to, to compute the, to fit the ergon, and then you want to see uh, the number of triads is different, you're not going to simulate very, like, a... Very different, but very there's different. not much variance in the triads. It's not much variance, so you're not going to be like... So then you're left with a real dilemma. Because what if your model requires you to... Maybe I'm wrong, but walk me through yeah, this, okay? Yeah, yeah. If, uh, if, in, if you say that your model, you're hypothesizing your model, huh? that triads form easily. Right. Okay. And you want to see if triads is And then you want to say, does triads impact performance? You're saying, oh, well, if triads form easily, by definition, now I can't use that to see if triads will predict performance. Kind of, yeah, that's, that's the problem. Because when you are simulating these networks, okay. most of the networks are, would have about the same number of triads. But right? have you but tried to see that they may be even a little bit now? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. So the, the short answer is I'm not sure what's going to happen. I mean, part but, of that, too, depends on the network size, too, right? So, like, you, you just have, like, a larger... You have more possible networks that are similar to your network, like at five compared to three, right? So it should be sensitive to. I guess that it, 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 the key part of there is that how strong is the association between the group performance and number of triads in this case? If it is very strong, then if you have just a small variation in the number of triads through your simulations, then it's fine, it should be fine. But if it's not that strong, then you can't do much. It, it, it won't, won't have enough power. But yeah, that's an interesting question, so I, I, I need to look at it. But. Yeah, because I think that some of the work that uh, that Aaron did, which used that other approach that you and I discussed, right, where we just look at the actual t values or something to it, there what we found is that in fact a lot of the configurations that formed were, that there were certain configurations that formed a lot. Right. But those were not the ones that were formed. Right. But, so for example, certain kinds of transitive tri triads would form, this was, this was with relational event models, so it's a little bit advanced, but same idea. Mm -hmm. But there were some things that kept happening all the time, so there were really significant parameters. You see that in all kinds of team interactions. But those were not the ones that were associated with performance. Yeah. So in that case, 
your model would work. Yeah, no, but, it's great, but you know what? So I, I've been thinking about this too lately a lot. And I think that in that case, if you want to test, for example, for a number of triads, then you shouldn't include that in the in your argon thing. Ah, there's a glass right. Oh my goodness. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, it's okay. Well, to be continued. Yes. Well, before we discuss, can we give a round of applause and thank, uh, thank Ken, Josh, and Josh?